How's everyone doing tonight? I have a special treat for you. Coming all the way out here from Amityville, New York. His name is Rick Fox, and he has done a ton in the music business. So let's bring out Mr. Rick Fox. He uh, is in the green room hanging out. With, uh, I have him. I have a waitress back there serving him drinks. Hopefully he's happy. So let's bring out Rick Fox. And you got the. Uh, I got my coffee mug. I got my coffee mug out today. You know, so I can. So do I. You see what mine says? <laughs> the answer is no. All right. Mine. This is my podcast show mug, and I do one for every show, Rick. So I'll, when I get yours done, I'll I'll shoot you over one. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, my, I had my my back in California. I had a, I don't know where I don't remember where I got it. But my coffee cup said the answer is no, and you flip it over and the other side it says the answer is still no. <laughs> and and by accident my wife broke it, oh. and oh, she no. saw how upset I was and she promised she'd get me another one, and I was never able to find that same one that says it's the answer is still no on the other <laughs> side. So I found this one. This answer is no on both sides on Amazon. That's hilarious. So, uh, uh, and I grew up with my father and, and my grandmother, his mother, in in uh, in uh, Greenpoint, Brooklyn. And uh, music didn't really get on my radar until the '60s. Well, no, I, I take that back. My when my dad got out of the Navy from in Korea, he used his GI Bill to put himself to broadcast school or CBS in New York. Right. And he said, as he tells it, I was sitting in the classroom. We're just about to graduate, and somebody, it was a knock at the door. Somebody came in from, I don't know, from higher up and said, who wants to start now? My dad was the first one, shot his hand up in the bag. He goes, all right, follow me. <laughs> and, and I, they, I don't re remember what my dad said after that, but he wound up getting his own uh, radio show on WGBB in Freeport, Long Island. Right. And because he was such a fan of of the big band swing you know the jazz of of his era right and, and sinatra and all of that uh he incorporated that into his radio show and you know oh. we're talking the old school stuff with the turntable and the glass window and the engineer on the other side and like that gotcha. and 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 uh and the whole trivia thing is uh my dad said his engineer was a guy named george savalas now if that rings a bell with anybody the Savalas okay. name. I don't know. So it, it, it's actually George was Telly's brother. Okay. The actor, Telly Savalas. Oh, okay. All right. And Telly Savalas, as he told me, is Jennifer Aniston's godfather. Really? I didn't know that. So talk about six degrees of separation. <laughs> uh, I still right. would like to meet Jennifer Aniston and tell her that story. <laughs> uh, but my dad interviewed, you know, the stars of the day on his show. Uh, I've got uh, copies of of the letters of the uh, uh, letters of thank you and, and acknowledgement and recognition of him interviewing their artists on the air, like that. And and uh, and he he took me down there one day on his day off. He had some something to do down there at the station. And I remember all the walls being painted that that industrial green that you used to see in hospitals and oh yeah oh yeah and whatnot like a military green kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like a, uh, but I think they call it zinc green because they painted mm. the insides of the right. the cockpits and right. planes that color. Almost like a rust, a rusty green or something. Rust yeah. color. And then we, then he took me down the street to an ice cream parlor. We had chocolate egg creams, which people only from people from Brooklyn or New York know what an egg cream is. It's like a chocolate soda. Okay. Uh, and that's so that's how it was introduced to me to get, to get back on point. So he would always play uh, that kind of music around the house. The right. big band, swing, you know, jazz, stuff like that. And uh, as I got introduced to it, well, in, in, let's say in the 60s, you know, when the Beatles and the Stones were, the records were coming out. Right. And we had, you know, uh, the radio stations in New York. And I would hear this stuff. I had a little transistor radio, like a lot of a lot of us did. And I'd put it under the pillow at night when I was sleeping until the batteries would die out <laughs> by, by morning. But, uh, you know, that's what I was listening to was, was that, that golden era of, the late 50s, early 60s, as it one le one style flipped over into the other. And so I was that's what I was listening to, all the early 60s stuff. It was a great time. Uh, by 66, 
you know, the Beatles were much more out there. Right. 67, we're getting into kind of the uh, the harder edge, uh, uh, almost psychedelic era. Right, right. Oh, yeah. Well, like that. And, you we're know, still Iron in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, Iron Butterfly and uh, uh, Lemon Jefferson, Pipers. Jeff, and, Jefferson and, and Airplane. Jefferson Airplane, definitely. Things like the Yardbirds. Right. Uh, and, and so this was all coming onto my radar. Uh, um, uh, Ted Nugent and Amboy Dukes. Oh wow! We're going you know, back. Status quo, status quo. Pictures of Matchstick Men, Cream. Uh, you know, this is all. It, it, music was starting to get that harder edge. The British Invasion was picking up. Right, right. Beatles and, came about of, later. Yeah. At, at the age of thirteen, my cousin bought me my first two albums. Uh, oh wait a minute, let me let me back up just a little bit. Yeah, she yeah she bought me my first two albums. was uh, um, the first Steppenwolf album, which had just come out. Right. With Born to Be Wild on it. And she bought me the Beatles Rubber Soul. Okay. So that's a hell of an introduction to music. Right. Right there. And I had discovered around that time, I discovered, uh, uh, I think somebody gave me an album by Gary Puckett in the Union Gap. Oh, wow. You know, and it, it, it was he was a hit factory. You know, woman, woman, young girl. Uh, uh, and he was doing a lot of covers and stuff, too. Right. Uh, but, but they weren't writing their own songs. They had There was an in-house staff writer's that would write it, and these guys would record it. And uh, Gary Puckett was a crooner, a powerful voice, ex excellent showman. But what grabbed me visually was on their album covers, they were all dressed in Civil War uniforms. Oh, wow. Okay, like 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 un Union, like like you know, like Yankees, Union Civil Civil War uniforms. I said these guys look like a gang, like a team. They're all <laughs> there's no mistaking. They're all in the same band. Right, right. The, the uniforms gave them a uniform look, and, and that's what was something that appealed to me at a, at a very early age. Uh, you know, and I listened to the music and stuff like that. So I had an exposure to a really wide range of musical styles. You know what? What was, year? What year? What period would that be in? When you're nineteen sixty-eight. Oh, okay. We're going way back. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. My, my my birthday is at the end of the year, not at the beginning. <laughs> So I'm actually technically 12 until December 28th. Then I turned 13. <laughs> so, so I was born 72 hours short of the next year. <laughs> so that's when the, when the age really kicks in was the following year. Uh, but Steppenwolf had been out in, in 67. Oh, yeah. I remember Steppenwolf. Yeah. Uh, early Steppenwolf and all that. But right. something about their music just resonated with me. I was in that as that young mind at that age, I was able to grasp and understand what John Kay was singing about in his lyrics. You know, and, and a lot of stuff he, he wrote was politically minded, but it was about not protesting, but it was to raise awareness about what was going on in the world. Gotcha. Uh, in, in addition to their other uh, uh, the themes of their other songs. Gotcha. Like that. So, so, uh, and he was, when he was a boy, uh, his father was, was killed on the Russian front. He was, John Kay was German. He and his mother were one of 15 people who escaped through the Iron Curtain. Mm -hmm. And, and only seven of them made it. Holy crap. But when they cut the barbed wire, they pushed him through first. Wow. And, and then his mom. And so he survived that. They moved to Canada. And then he got into involved in the music scene in Canada and country music and blues and things like that. He he appreciated the uh, uh, the, the blues music that the black artists were playing at the time in America. Right. And so that that all played into what he was doing. Uh, and and so I, I followed his journey. I, I studied everything about the band uh, because I was so enamored with everything about Steppenwolf. Right. And what what brought me to being a bass player was finally seeing them on television. And the black leather, you know, oh, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, the, the bass player, Nick St. Nicholas, uh, had this buckskin jacket with the fringes and the leather pants and the headband. Oh, yeah. and, that became and very popular. Like, he's just grooving really cool. <laughs> I'm like, that's it. I want to be I want to be that guy. And <laughs> that's why I became a bass player was because of Steppenwolf. Well, you know, you know, you've done a, you've done so much in in your career. I kind of want to bump a little bit towards the seventies right now. Let's get a little bit closer to when you met <laughs> Peter <laughs> Chris, <Okay. laughs> because you've got such a long history, and uh, and I know that you have some other things early in life. And I had a list. I had a list of bullet points I was going to talk about your early life, your career, 
you know, and, and we're going to be talking about Wasp, and your, your dealings with being in the band Steeler, and your solo project with Sin, and your new band life, which is uh, Burn and Surgical Steel. And you have some new interests, and also the California State Military Reserve. You've done some work there. And, yes, I did. Uh, and you have a huge discography, which I just looked up. Oh, my God. And I have a very musical audience on the Dean Vaughn Music Podcast Show. So they're going to want to know what you're playing, Rick. So we're going to talk a little bit about your equipment, what kind of bass you play. Um, uh, do you have a favorite and, and what you go to? And and then we're going to talk about how to get in touch with Rick Fox. Is that there an it Epiphone? Is. is that an Epi? There it is. That's at my Epiphone Thunderbird. Nice, nice. With, with my, my killer rocket launch EMG pickups. Very and cool. I've got a I've got a uh that a, a Babbage, fire, man. Babbage hardware, full contact hardware bridge, okay. which makes all the difference in the world. You know, I don't know much about bass guitars, but that's the first time I've heard that. And all my bass playing audience out there, I'm sure they understand what you're talking about. Yeah. But you yep. get that you get that sharp attack. I don't know if, if I'm the first one that said that to you. You get a very sharp attack, which I love on the bass guitar. I love to hear when you hit the note. And I hear I heard that on the last recording you sent me. Um, it was on the run, I think. Probably. What's well, one of several songs? Yeah. On the run. What a bitchin' song, man. And uh we'll Thank get you. to play we'll get to play that one during the show. Okay. as well but i i wanted I, we talked a little bit about your early life and i'm going into your career and okay let's talk a little bit about in the 70s you met peter chris and now you were doing photography or something and then you ended up dating a joanna was it joanne joanne okay and she joanne was Crisco, Durant, yeah well he was, uh, peter called himself peter chris but his name is chris gola gotcha so, and this so, was uh, before was this before kiss Oh, yeah, absolutely. Way before Kiss. I think everyone wants to hear that. So let's talk a little bit about how you met him, that whole thing, and then when Kiss got started. Okay, when I was in high school, this was like uh, between 1970 and 74. Okay. So it was probably around 70, 71. My dad bought me a German Hadamex Practica Nova 1B 35-millimeter camera. It was like not state-of-the-art, but, I mean, German lenses were like the top of the line. Yeah. Back yeah. then, well, Germany so is the king I, was, of, I, yeah. I became like a you know a, a budding young photography nut, taking pictures of. I used to have, I used to build models, like a lot of kids, and and military you know, tanks and stuff like that. <laughs> right. And I would I would detail them, and then I would take really like zoomed in pictures of the tanks, you know, because oh, cool. my dad my dad was a subscriber to uh, one of those magazines that you know uh, American Modeler or something. So right. it was, and my dad built models and stuff. So I. I my dad was my biggest influence in life. So whatever awesome. interest he was in, I, I shared that from him. Gotcha. And so I built models like a lot of kids and planes and tanks and rockets and stuff. So I would take pictures of this stuff. And then in high school, I joined the photography club. Now I had access to all the film developing uh, uh, materials, all the chemicals. I had, I've had full access to the photography lab room. Oh, I see. I got you. And I paid. I paid attention. I, I learned how it was done, and after school, I would take all of my film in there, and I would develop the, the negatives. Right. And then I would I would uh, print all the pictures. Cool. And, and so so uh, um, that led to me being a photographer, and uh, uh, being exposed to to some of the, the the music the bands that were coming out of New York at the time, like the New York Dolls and and that whole scene, the glam scene. Uh, I managed to fake my way into, uh, uh, into a uh, a fake ID. Okay. And and I would I would there was the stores in New York in Manhattan that sold rock star clothing, like jumping J jumping Jack Flash, JJ Flash, uh, Granny's takes a trip, things like that. <laughs> I had platform boots, platform shoes, satin pants. Back then in New York, if you dressed like the bands when you get in the club, right. You were not looked at like it, the word poser was not invented yet. That's a California <laughs> thing. That's a Nobody, Hollywood. That, 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 concept, that concept did not exist. Right. If you dressed like everyone else on the scene, right. you were you were considered a supporter of the scene. Right. 
you know. So all the girls <laughs> dressed up, all the guys dressed up. Everybody wore, you know, fancy clothes and platform shoes, and everybody was a peacock, you know, yeah. like that. And so I, I emulated that. Well, yeah. well, dressing like that also was like my camouflage. It allowed me to get into the, it allowed me to get into the clubs. Right, right. You know. So, yeah. so uh, with that, uh, there was a club in Queens called Coventry. It used to be called the Pop Popcorn Pub, okay. Popcorn Club. And I took pictures of uh, uh, some of the glam bands that were playing there: the Brats, um, uh, Isis, Turned Down Broadway. Uh, that's where I ph photographed Kiss later on. Okay, and I, I I bumped shoulders with the guys from the New York Dolls. You know, were, well much older than me, but like that. So uh, in '72, uh, the Criscola family moved uh, around the corner from me. Okay, I, I was living in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. They came out of Williamsburg, which was the next town over. That's right. where Peter grew up. Peter grew up okay. there with with uh, Jerry Nolan, who was the drummer from the Dolls. And and it, the Williamsburg was a very tough area, very tough. I had a paper route through there. It was a really tough area. <laughs> Didn't we all have paper routes back then? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I saw them down the end of the street, you know, playing ball with themselves. It was Joanne, her sister Donna, and and then their, their friend Anne Marie from who lived right. around the corner, right? Uh, Anne Marie Hughes, and and eventually I worked my way up the block and and you know kind of got to meet them and oh, they would somehow lose the ball by accident. It would happen to come over where I was. <laughs> I go bring them their ball back. You know, you, you even and, had the and, women chasing you back then. <laughs> yeah, well, I got that. Um, but uh, uh, Joanne kind of had a, a resemblance. I, I, the way, the best way I could describe it was she looked like a young version of Cher. Oh wow! You know, she kind of had that that you know uh, uh, European. Italian kind of look, you know, uh, prominent nose, uh, uh, long, uh, dark hair like that. Uh, the, the people in the neighborhood who were not kind called them gypsies, you see, uh, right. because they, they didn't look like everybody else in the neighborhood. But every time <laughs> Mrs. Criscola would walk by the house when they went grocery shopping, if I happened to be sitting out in front of my house, she'd look at me, she'd smile. She was very pleasant. I would, she'd smile, say hi. I would say hi back. And and the girls would, would be walking with her. They wouldn't say anything. It's, you know how girls are at that age. They giggle. You know, they don't really. Well, they, uh, punch they, you, they punch you yeah, in the arm. They didn't socialize that much. With, <laughs> yeah, with the rest of the neighborhood. So uh, eventually I started to hang out with them. Yeah. Make a short, a long story even longer. Uh, I hung out with them. <laughs> I got, and I started, I started to date Joanne. And uh, she was, I think, 17 at the time. I was probably like 18 or 19. Probably 19. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and um, um, she they said, well, our our big brother, Joe, uh, big, it was a brother, Joey, our big brother, Peter, he's a rock star. I was like, oh, OK, well, maybe someday I'll get to meet him. And at that time, I think Peter had just come out of the band Chelsea. OK. They had one album out. I think it was on CBS. They were like a psychedelic kind of hard rock, psychedelic with a, just a little taste of Grateful Dead in some of the songs like that. Uh, uh, is is and, Peter Chris older than you, Rick? Is, how old, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's all, he, was still, he was the oldest guy in Kiss. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's right. I forgot how old he was. I think he was like 27 or 28 when I met him. Okay. Uh, and I was uh, I was about eight, 19. Or, and uh, I think Gene and Paul were like 25 at the time. So okay. Peter was the okay. oldest guy in the band. He was the oldest guy. I got you. Yeah. So uh, he came um, at one point, you know, he answered the uh, the, the, the famous ad in, in the Village Voice and Rolling Stone. Uh, uh, he put he put that show are willing to do anything to make it. And he got the call from Peter and Gene. When did and Ace so, Freely when did Ace Freely get in the band? Was that later? that was that was later. That was much. OK, was there, there was no ace at this point. Gotcha. Uh, Peter was living. Peter was married to Lydia at that time. He was living down further down in, in South Brooklyn. And he would borrow Lydia's uh, Chevy Silver Nova to come on his way to Manhattan to rehearse with Gene and, and Paul. He'd stop at, at his mom's house. So I happened to be there and he showed up and uh, and looked like a rock star. He had the big layered rooster haircut. We call right. it a root. That was like Rod Stewart. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody had that, that layered haircut. Uh, sure, um, we all did. Uh, uh, Paul McGregor came over from England. 
after he was he was cutting all the British rock stars hair. That was the new style with all these layers in it. And and on, on the Rod Stewart, not as good as a wink to a blind horse album. There's the <laughs> marionettes, and he's got this spiky hair sticking up, all unkempt. Him and Ronnie Wood, and, and that was called a rooster haircut. And and so they were cutting all the rock stars in, in England their hair that way. Then Paul McGregor came over to America, and he set up shop in Manhattan. That was he was doing all the new rock and roll haircuts. Oh, okay. And and <laughs> and movie stars, movie stars in Hollywood, Warren Beatty, Jane Fonda, everybody was getting those layered haircuts. I think everybody so, was doing Peter, that back then. Yeah, Peter had that haircut. Uh, really tall, had the big platform boots on, uh, you know, tight jeans. He kind of looked like a, almost like a heavy rock version of John Lennon. Okay. Because he, he, he would wear those round glasses like John right, Lennon had. Right, right, They became popular too. Yeah, you know, and, and he, he talked like, uh, like a cross between Al Pacino and, and uh, a Robert De Niro. You know, your typical, <laughs> stereotypical Italian wise guy, gangster kind of guy, you know. Gangster, hey, you know. Yeah, yeah. You. But, but but his voice wasn't as high-pitched as Pesci. <laughs> <laughs> so we're still in the early 70s right now with your career. Let's let's move on to New Jersey. You went over to New Jersey and you got, who? what did you do in 76 and 77? You were in New uh, Jersey club circuit. And this is about the time, uh, I believe you were going to start Sin. Is that right? There we go. Uh, um, we're, we're kind of skipping over my professional debut. And <laughs> well, let's go back. <laughs> I don't want to skip over anything. Um, yeah. Uh, well, Kiss, Kiss became a very big influence on me. Gotcha. As they were, as okay. they, when Ace came in, they got they. That was there when I entered. When uh, we kept Bill a coin from leaving the Diplomat Hotel, we made him stay there to see Kiss, and the rest was history, as they say. History. Uh, <laughs> history. Okay, gotcha. But, but uh, uh, you know, and and uh, uh, so I graduate high school. It's 1974, 75. I'm working okay. in Manhattan as a messenger. And I'm sitting outside one of the buildings there having lunch, and this girl walks by, and she's got the same haircut as me. <laughs> the spiky, you know, the, 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 right. the, like, like David Bowie had, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love Bowie's hair. And and, and she, got, we got to be talking like, oh, look, two of the same creatures. Look at us. <laughs> uh, and she had told me about this club, this famous legendary club in Manhattan called Max's Kansas City. Okay. And I had, I had never heard of it, but this is where it was an Andy Warhol uh, uh, art scene that attracted Alice Cooper, David Bowie, Lou Reed, okay, uh, you, you know, music stars that were part of his entourage, and then so it became a, a like a rock club. Gotcha. And, and Alice Cooper got signed out of there. Springsteen got signed out of there. Bob Marley got. It's okay. a legendary club. Wow. Okay. It's, it's a legendary stage. If the walls could talk, but it, the club's not there anymore. Is that CBGB? Is that one of the clubs as well down there? That was further downtown. That was further on the down. Bowery. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Max's was at 17th Street and Park Avenue South. Gotcha. Uh, right across the park from the Academy of Music, which later became the Palladium. Gotcha. Okay. And so uh, she introduced me to this club. And and I walk in, and I'm telling you, I didn't know who they were at the time, but I was being, I, they were being pointed out to me. There's the Ramones, there's uh, oh, Wayne County, oh. there's Tough Dart, there's right. Robert Gordon, wow. there's all these people who became famous out of the Max's scene. Gotcha. You know, and, and I eventually was rubbing shoulders with all of these people. Wow. And so I got introduced to a guitar player named Sebastian, uh, well, now he's Sebastian Black. Back then he was Sebby Castle. Okay. Uh, uh, it's you know Ital another Italian guitar player. Right. Uh, he had a group called the Martian Rock Band. Okay. So we got to talking, and he liked my look. He says, I, "I think I'd like to replace our bass player after talking to you." We had a lot in common. We were into like fifties and sixties sci-fi movies, you know, and flying saucers and and Ray Harryhausen. So we had a great <laughs> a great common bonding ground right there. Right. We were fans of the genre, and he said, "Well, that's what my band is trying to go in that direction." Gotcha. I, that's what I said. I gotcha. So I went to see one of their shows, and and he was the only one. He had like a purple jumpsuit. He came out of a big silver box. It was like the size of a refrigerator. <laughs> and it, like, oh my god! Like that. And and there really wasn't that much stage effects. It was a silver box with a red lightning on it. <laughs> 
and and uh. the drummer was wearing up. The drummer had had see through drums, a nice. silver lame suit. Bass wow. player didn't really do anything. Just kind of kind stood of, there. It's kind of Bowie-ish a little bit. Yeah, Bowie did a lot of that. Yeah. So he brought me up to their loft, which was uh, the two fifty West. Uh, 30, I think it was 37th Street. I could be wrong. I don't have it in front of me. It was a famous, it was, it, it, Manhattan had so many industrial buildings with all of these industrial lofts in them. Right, right, right. And this whole building was all bands, all musicians, you see. Oh, cool. So they, they had a loft up on the seventh floor. It was probably maybe 15, 15 or 20 feet by about 12. I don't know. And the windows, were, you looked right out over the street like that. And, you know, you sit up in one end of the room and, and like that. And, and so a little bit of the Roxy being up there at the top of the Roxy. Or... Yeah, yeah. And so it was really small. Uh, he was very kind and very patient with me because I still did not know what, what I was doing as a bass player. You know, I, I'll admit that. I uh, it, It's an inside joke by saying I was green then because I became <laughs> green afterwards. Uh well, <laughs> We'll get to that. <laughs> uh, he taught me all the songs, uh, and, went, and it were very simple, very like fifties type arrangements, uh, right. uh, hard, hard rock. Uh, very, there were, there were very simple songs. Nothing was super complex, right? And and, and I, I'm indebted to him for that for having the patience of showing me what I was doing. Yeah, and and we talked more about image, and and going into a more of a sci-fi image, and in one of the songs. The first song actually is "Take Me to Your Leader," <laughs> uh, uh, and he introduces each member of the band. Like they will play, and there's a stop, and he goes, "Drummer, he's from like that," and then we play more, and he stop. He goes, "Bass player, he's from Mercury," blah blah like that, and, and he goes, and "I'm the greatest, right? Yeah, and I'm the greatest magician in the galaxy," which was another <laughs> one of our songs. Okay. So I go home. I'm sitting in my basement, and I get this little vanity thing with a mirror, and I go, "Mercury." Now I'm from Mercury. What could I possibly be in a science fiction band called a Martian <laughs> rock band? What character <laughs> persona could I plausibly create here? Oh, my God. That's funny. And I said, well, my favorite monster, universal monster at the time, was the creature from the Black Lagoon. Oh, yeah. He had scales all over him. Right, right. Okay. And I thought, okay, well, Mercury's a hot planet. Well, in, on the Earth... We have deserts, and there are lizards that live in the deserts. Right. And the lizards have scales. So let me create a, a, a reptilian character for myself. <laughs> and I got this this uh, frosty cream make I I I makeup. Right. I, I my any any of my skin that was expired had a a, a black spandex capizio bodysuit. Oh yeah. With the opening in the front, uh, nice. and I had. I, I copied Ace Frehley's costume from the cover, cover of Kiss Alive. Okay. With the little shooting stars made of rhinestones and the, right. and the little comets and galaxies and stuff, and the stars like that. Uh, so I created a character as a cross between Ace and Gene. Okay? okay. So I became this lizard monster from space. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I took a black pencil, eyeliner pencil, and I drew all these scales on my chest like a <laughs> lizard. Oh, my God. And I had my eyebrows. I did my eyebrows up like Spock from Star Trek. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. And I sprayed silver streaking tips in my hair to make silver accents. Wow. And I had these silver platform boots that looked like something out of Rollerball with these. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where Kiss like... got started with the big boots. <laughs> yeah. They looked like a shorter version of Ace's ankle platform yeah. boots. Yeah, yeah. Like they, took a, they took it one step further. <laughs> yeah. And, and when I showed that to, to Sebi, he was like, "Oh, now I gotta, now I gotta, uh, I gotta raise the bar." <laughs> and he started painting his face with these kind of weird kept you know, designs on him and stuff. <laughs> now we're really getting somewhere, right? Right. You see, <laughs> and and uh, he 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 we used to go to all of the uh, the magic shops on Broadway around Forty Second Street, you know that that supplied all the magicians that were in in the theaters. Yeah, you know, if you remember the Pee Wee Herman's uh, adventure, he goes into the magic store and the guy's got all these. Magic right. novel, same thing. Okay. So Sebi, Sebi taught me how he used to shoot fire out of the headstock of his guitar. Wow. He had a flying V, and he he cut out extra tails or wings. So the flying V had two more wings on the top 
Wow. And two more wings on the body. It was like six, a flying bee with six wings. <laughs> That's crazy, man. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm telling you. But we were off the map. We were so off the map. And he that flying bee was very popular at the time. Yeah. 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 He taught me the Explorer. The, uh, I think the Explorer had one, the flying bee. Uh, but, you know, well, it was the V and it was the Explorer. Right, right, uh, right. Those, gotcha. those are the, the early Gibson, you know, futuristic looking guitars. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and so he taught me the gag on how to shoot the fire out of the headstock. <laughs> I incorporated that into my hand because I was a fan of Spider-Man. And when, oh. he, 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 when he hits those, those, you know, the center of his hands, yeah. Yeah. he would shoot the, 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 the webs out of his wrist. Right. So I just blended that into this gag. And I would shoot the fire out of my hand with the same <laughs> principle. I had the thing under the, under a pair of silver lame gloves. Oh my gosh! And, I, and when I would when I would squeeze the center of my hand, this stuff, this substance would shoot out of my finger. And then I would the my igniter was flash paper. Oh my god! See, so and I would shoot this flame out of my finger, <laughs> and, and 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 because you know I was a, a lizard. <laughs> and I copied, I copied, I, I copied Gene. Oh my so god! I, I put a couple of drops of green food coloring in my mouth. Oh no! <laughs> so I would stick my tongue out, and people would see this big, this green tongue, and it, it was. I'm telling you, Dean, is that where Gene got it from? You it was the know. first. It, it was just worth the shock and awe to see the expression on people's faces. <laughs> you go up there and, and you stick out your tongue and the whole inside of your mouth is green. Well, you wanted to get noticed. Well, that's one way to do it, Rick. Um, <laughs> and I, I, if I took a mouthful of beer and it yeah. turned into foam, I oh. opened my mouth and all this green foam would roll out of my mouth. Oh my so I looked gosh. like like this, this. I looked like some psychedelic lizard <laughs> who had, ra had rabies. You know, oh my God! You know, and that and that became popular late seventies, eighties, and uh, I remember going down to the Troubadour. You know, I'm a little bit uh, earlier than you, or later than you were. Yeah. yeah. And I remember uh, seeing a wasp down there. You know, spitting out blood and throwing meat in the crowd and all this crazy antics. And it's almost what it took to get noticed in the Hollywood scene was to just go over the top. You had you to. Know? You had you to. Had, you know, that, some things awe. never changed. Shock and awe. I mean, you had uh, screaming Jay Hawkins. And he had a uh, he had a hat that would be fire. She would shoot out of his hat, <laughs> and he'd be like, "I put a spell on you." <laughs> put a spell. You know, and, and Alice Cooper, you know, with his right, early right, you know, right. So uh, each generation had its shock and awe guy. Yeah, you know, and, and we know exactly who that who those people were. Going back right. to David Bowie, David Bowie, Bowie was. Well, well, he, he he awed, but he didn't really shock that much. Right, I don't, right. <laughs> not, and Elton, not, even Elton John, you know, those kind of were farmers. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's called show business for a reason. Absolutely. But there's there's show business. Well, and then there's it, show business. Right, right, right. And and I, that's why I called it the Dean Vaughn Music Podcast Show because I got people like you on it that can tell us more about the show and how the show got started back in the late seventies and even earlier, the late sixties. I was I was I was a willing victim of all of my influences and I wear them on my sleeve. I, I know you do, and you talk about you you have such great stories. Uh, you, you we I've been talking to you now for the last couple of weeks and man I'll tell you we could have done an interview on the phone you know from all the stories yeah yeah and I, and I, and that's why I want to try to let the audience know what exact where you came from what what you how'd you get here you know how did you get here and, it's, a, uh, it's complicated <laughs> it, it, it you know it is I, I'm very confused so that's why I want to hear it from you well, yeah, it's, uh, I, 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 let me just add to the confusion, if I if I may. <laughs> well, that's why I'm interviewing you, so you can clarify a few things. You know that you've uh, yeah. you've and, done and, you've and, done and, so much. And add add more introduce more confusion while I'm answering the question. <laughs> so what I'm, is it I'm, about I'm, Rick Fox? I don't yeah, get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people are going to be very confused. I, I want to keep them interested, of course. You know, and we're moving into '76. You're we're kind of mid '70s well, well, right now. Uh, okay, hang on. Uh, when you you mentioned David Bowie, uh, right. let me tie that in real quick, and we'll go right into the. You got it. Uh, we attracted so much attention by what we were doing that uh, there was a person who was working with Wayne County, who became Jane County. Okay. Uh, was a, was a very famous photographer on the scene in New York at the time, right. named Lee Black Childers. Okay. And Lee worked for Main Man, which was David Bowie's management. Gotcha. Lee saw us. And it's like, oh, my God, I've got to take pictures of you guys. You are fantastic. <laughs> I love you guys. And he's like making eyes at me, you know. 
and he, he came to our loft. He took a lot of pictures of us. We were in Rock Scene Magazine. Uh, like I said, we we I, I became a veteran of the Maxis Kansas City 1970s, mid-70s, New York Rock Scene. I was now one of them. Okay. Yeah. And, and 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 uh what happened was uh we 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 um we got a new drummer in the band and that worked out great. And then one day Sebi gave the drummer the money for the rent to give to the landlord and the drummer disappeared with the money and the band broke up. We oh, had no, no drummer <laughs> and no money to keep the loft. Oh, so no. that was how the Martian rock band expired and, and crashed into the earth. <laughs> that being said, um, I found myself working off and on uh, in, in what they call the West Village in Manhattan, uh, uh, 8th Street. Right. 8th Street was famous for all of the all the clothing shops and most specifically a very famous and legendary recording studio called Electric Lady. Okay. And everybody who's anybody who knows about the history of rock music knows what Electric Lady Studios was started by Jimi Hendrix. Wow, oh, okay. And and it was a psychedelic place from from top to bottom when you got in there. But uh there was a store a couple of doors down from there that I worked at. And one day in walks this, this guy with a similar haircut and his girl. And and he, we got to talk. And, I mean, when you see each, there wasn't a lot of us around, but when you see each other, we tend to gravitate and have a conversation. <laughs> and and, and I, I was always looked rocked out, you know, like that. And, and so uh, we got to talking and he was in a band in New Jersey called Virgin. Okay. And I said, I said, oh, I saw your picture in Roxy Magazine. You guys are standing out on a on the on the uh, the boardwalk. He goes, yeah, that's us. They had a a glam. They were like a well, we call them tribute bands now, but back then they were they were, were all cover bands. Right, right, right. And and everybody's covering, you know, uh, Virgin covered like Alice Cooper, David Bowie, Martha Hoople, Kiss, uh, whatever the British is sweet, whatever the British glam the British wave. invasion, right? And and and, the, and they had an Alice Cooper set. <laughs> And and Ian the singer would come out with this like eight nine foot boa around his neck. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. So so Alice was doing it. Some of us were copying it too. Right. There was a, a there was a, an older version of of Virgin. It was a band famous band in Jersey called Harlow. And and they used to do the same kind of show. This was before Twisted Sister. Uh, uh, Harlow did that. So yeah. Virgin was like Harlow Junior. And then Twisted Sister came out after that. <clears throat> okay. And and, and this, is, this is not to be confused with the band Virgin. It came out of California later. Gotcha. That, that was managed by Bill O'Coin. See all these okay. dots connecting. Yeah, I'm I'm seeing it now. Yeah. So so one thing led to another, and and they replaced their bass player. Now I'm finding myself stepping into almost every band I I join. I'm replacing the guy that they they got rid of. <laughs> and they all the, the the thing that ties it all together is. I, 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 you know, I have that it, what they call the it factor. Right. You have that it factor. You're bringing something to the table that that's missing, but they want or they need in their band. Right. Right. That's right. what I, I, Rick Fox became the guy with the it factor. Mm -hmm. And I was replacing these bass players from band to band to band. And so I, they brought me into Virgin. Uh, and we played the Jersey club circuit like that. And at this, that was 76, 77. What, and, was the and, what was the longest band you've been in back then? I mean, what, the longest was it just like bang, 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 or did you did you stick with anybody back then for a while? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I was in Virgin from seventy six to seventy nine. Okay, so four like, or five years. Okay, yeah, seventy eight, seventy nine. We we played all over the place. That's a nice run. Uh, later on, when I was in the E Walker band, I was in from like eighty, eighty one, almost two years or a year, okay. a little over a year, year and a half. I don't know. Uh, it depends because you know nobody's perfect. You're gonna there's gonna be well, there's gonna always gonna be conflict and things like that. It, well, is, it's still in, in, is this in. is this still in New Jersey, Rick? Are you still in New Jersey right now? Yeah, yeah, we're still okay. okay. in Jersey. Gotcha. Jersey. Look, they, Jersey metal. Jersey, I love the shirt. Jersey man. metal, I love. I'm, it. I'm, well, no, it's it's a book. I'm, I'm in the book. Awesome. But, uh, it's it's, a, it's an excellent book for those can people. Can look. people find that book on like on Amazon? Yes, yes. It, 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 I think it's a, I think it's JerseyMetal.com. JerseyMetal.com. Uh, I'd have to get up and go to my bookcase and bring it up and show you the book. But well, I think uh, people will find it if they want to find it. They'll find yeah. it. Yeah, 
Uh, it's it's like yay thick. It's such a high quality book. Uh, I, I might even download it myself. It's a massive coffee table book, and it's got yeah. everybody from Jersey in it. That's everybody. Cool. That is cool, man. Bon Jovi, Twisted Sister, even English bands. You name it, they're in it. Wow. And UK? Anyway. You know, the UK, so, all that, yeah. So now, now I discovered, I was introduced to a band called Angel. Okay, I remember Angel. Okay. And when I finally saw what they looked like on the, on the album, Hell of a Band, I went, Game Changer. I saw Punky Meadows. I went, that's it. I want to look like that guy. Right. The you know? angel, the white. And I, I designed, well, at first my hair looked like Mickey Jones, their bass player. Oh, yeah. And and so I went out and some this girl made me a costume that kind of looked like his. White white spandex, the, the white cape. The cape, uh, had, like the white cape. Yeah, I had a, um, I had white and, and python checkerboard snake skin platform mm -hmm. boots. Uh, <laughs> The platforms were about five inches, and the heels were about eight inches. They were so, huge. <laughs> well, Kiss might have got their idea from. <laughs> no, I, I, I look. We were all copying those guys. Come yeah, on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like that. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, there was a huge industry for platform boots back then. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'll bet there was. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, and and you know, with these boots on, I could I could paint ceilings real easy. <laughs> Hang drywall. <laughs> well, you know, if if I'm six yeah. feet tall yeah. and I've got on boots that are like you know eight <laughs> nine inches tall, oh, I'm shit. like seven two seven three. How tall are you, you know, anyway? <laughs> people looking up. I'm six foot. You know, people oh are looking God. up. At you like that. <laughs> There's That's an intimidation true. factor too. Right, right, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and the girls loved it. Whatever you did, the girls loved it. You know, absolutely. And so, so Virgin, we changed some members. Uh, became uh, um, sin. Okay. okay. We, 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 I came up. I don't. Know, I don't remember what the the influence was at the moment, but somehow because you know we were all it was tempting rock and roll. Everybody was playing off the sexual innuendos at the time. Gotcha. And I and um, we didn't have an internet to search for anything, but I, I came up with the sin and I drew a snake, you know, like this with the tail underneath. And and the eye had the apple was a uh, there was an apple with a bite in it was the dot over the eye, and we, <laughs> and we we our tagline was hot tempting rock and roll. Oh, nice! <laughs> and that's that's where it was born, and like from seventy six to seventy seven, and and so and we played the uh, uh, you know uh, the Bronx and more more Jersey club. Uh, there was a, a huge bank in Jersey City that was abandoned, and that was the rehearsal for all these bands in Jersey. We're rehearsing uh, in this, this giant band. We had a massive, massive loft. It was in, in, like an, almost an entire floor. Wow, wow, wow. That wow. was our loft, and, and we could do whatever we wanted there. Is this about the time you met Basil Stanley? Was he? Basil, yeah, Basil Stanley, yeah. Basil, so Basil Stanley, he was the drummer. Basil. But his, his, name, his name is actually Stan Bissell. Stan Bissell, okay. Stan went to college with Gene and Paul. Oh, small world. <laughs> In upstate New York, yeah. Oh wow! And, and so he was—he he knew the guys in Kiss too. I met—I met Stan Basil Basil and Max's. He okay. came to hang out there. He was—he okay. lived in Queens. He lived in Queens. He was a stockbroker by day. No shit. <laughs> and he had long hair, but he was a yeah. stockbroker. Nice. And then you know, so he was making some decent, you know, income. Right. He had his own—he had his own house or apartment in 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 Queens, and and. Uh, when we needed a drummer, I knew he was a drummer, and I said, "Baz, would you consider coming in, you know, auditioning for our band?" He goes, "No, nope, you should. Where, when, and where?" He came down. He knew a lot of the songs anyway, right? In advance, he knew all the Kiss songs. He knew a lot of the, and and he so he he joined. He was our drummer in in, in Sin. Okay, okay, yeah. And I didn't have a car, so coming from Queens, he'd stop by me in Brooklyn, and we'd just go right over the bridge or in the tunnel. And we, we'd stop in Chinatown, pick up some food, and we'd, we'd rehearse in Belleville, New Jersey, in a, in, a, <laughs> yeah. in a converted garage that was soundproofed. Gotcha. And that's where we rehearsed. And who was uh, Vinny? So Who's Vinny Matthews? Where'd he fit in? Vinny Matthews was, he called himself uh, uh, Keith Stars. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He was, he was the oldest guy in the band. <laughs> Another and, Peter and Chris. <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, uh, yeah, and... and uh, well, at first, when I auditioned for them, when they were Virgin, Vinny was the one that didn't want me in the band. He goes, this guy, get no, no, I'm not going to play with him. And Ian, yeah. God bless Ian Chris. Ian goes, you know what? 
He's got something we need in this band. I don't care what it takes. Teach him whatever. He's in the band, period. I want him in the band. Right. So, again, I wasn't that great of a bass player, but we would get together. They'd come in from Jersey, and we'd sit down in my basement, and they would they taught me all the songs. So I was getting better as we go along with each fan. You had a lot I, of star you know, quality. You had that star quality. I mean, I'm not going to go on stage and not know what I'm doing. Oh, absolutely. No. But you had, so you had that look yeah. and you had that star quality that everybody wanted. That's kind That's of what, what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just I just needed – here's the star quality. I just needed to bring the musician quality <laughs> up to meet that. And, and, and I'm, not a, I'm, that. Not a, I'm not ashamed to admit that. We all have to start somewhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, 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 my, my mother's second husband – Bought me my first bass right after like 68, 69, like that. Right. Took me to took me to Sam Ash in Hempstead. I wanted a Rickenbacker, but they didn't want to spend that much money. So he he did. Get... Oh, hold on, Rick. I lost your sound there. And and uh, hang on a Bring it, okay. Go ahead. Re repeat yeah, that. Got, Go ahead. Yeah, they got me. They got me a beginner bass. Uh, but my 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 dad couldn't afford to get me music lessons. Oh, okay. I mean, I mean, you know, we were we were a middle class family, but there was no e extra capital for me and to you, do and something. You, like and you didn't have the YouTube to look up bass lines. And <laughs> <laughs> well, there was no internet. <laughs> there was no internet. Yeah, you know. So I, I would I would put the records on in the basement and try to copy what I could hear. I had no idea what what the strings were. You know, uh, uh, G D A and E. I didn't know that. Right. I right, didn't know. Right. I didn't know the frets. I didn't know anything about that. I just yeah. would try and match the set i try to teach myself you see yeah yeah yeah. like that so i was i was just you know i, I uh, well in this lineup you, know, you were in 1978 through 1979 right and and chris left to join another band called angel face is that right angel face wow you did you did some really deep homework wow <laughs> i want to know more about angel face and uh and i'm sure that leads into the next story which i'm going to let you tell well, Angel Face was one of the top uh, club bands in Jersey. Okay, they had they had one or two female singers. This is this had to be like around seventy five because they I remember when they were doing Life in the Fast Lane by the Eagles. Right, right, right. And and they were doing that song uh, uh, on the same stage that we were playing. We would go on our off night. We'd go watch it. Uh, Ian Back became in the fast lane. right. Woo. Ian became friends. Every Love Ian this. became friends with the band. Mm. Uh, Ian was also a drummer. He, he knew how to play drums. Okay. So when, when for Ian to leave Sin was purely a business decision, not personal. Gotcha. Gotcha. He wanted to make a little more money. He was going after the dollar sign. I'm sure he would admit to that. And he, he told us the night we were playing at the Rolling Stone in the Bronx, we were the, we, we, he says, I'm, I'm leaving to join Angel Face. And I sat there and I, thought, I cried my eyes out. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> he, goes, he goes. He goes. Look. He goes. I'm, I'm Rick. It's not personal. He goes. I. I want to make. I need to make more money. Ian's day job. It's all about job, the money, man. You got to make some Ian's money. Day, yeah. Yeah. Ian's day job. Ian's day job was a bus driver, a school bus driver. Oh my gosh. Okay. So he wanted to. He needed to augment what he does at night. Sure. He needed to make. You know, he was married, and you know, he needed to make more money. Absolutely. So, so uh, no shame in that. He joined Angel Face as their drummer. And that's when that first lineup of sin folded. Gotcha, gotcha. And then, you know, and then uh, um, um, I, I began hanging out at a club in Manhattan in the Bowery, just up a few doors down from from uh, CBGBs. CBGBs. And I, had, and I, and I, and I right. had played CBG. I played CBGBs with the Martian Rock Band as well. Uh, we actually we played there before ACDC did. Did you really? Jesus. Yeah. They they ACDC played there in seventy seven. We played there in 75, 76. Wow. But, but, but anyway, there was a club called the Great Gildersleeve. It was like a a, a mid range. Uh, uh, it was it was several buildings gutted, and they it was a gigantic old New York type club. Had an upstairs, had balconies, had a huge stage, brick walls. The bar was almost the length of the whole club. You know, and and all the New York bands played there, and all the bands who just came out with their first album. That made it making the transition from a small stage to a, a medium bigger stage would play there. So that's why I started hanging out and I was working for all of these bands who were just getting signed and had an album out. So I, I was uh, I was dating the, the receptionist at Record Plant 
in New York recording studio. And I met the band Trigger, who was a big, big Jersey band. Right. Uh, they were doing their first album there. So I, I started working for Trigger. Uh, uh, who else did I, I I did lights. I did concert lighting for a lot of bands in there. I, I ran the, uh, the Super was that, your was that your business for a while? Uh, well, yeah, kind of. Well, it was a, it was a great way to get in the club and hang out for free. Absolutely, Absolutely. you know. Uh, yeah. So, so I was there was a big Super Trooper follow spot that I worked, and there was a, a light board right below it, and I was able to work both of them at the same time. And that was like considered uh, high technology back then. I'll bet. Well, you know, I applied myself. Leading you know, it, I I, <laughs> I, 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 I applied yeah. myself. Yeah. Uh, I, I I did whatever it took to learn how to do something. You see, yeah. and and I worked I worked for about a dozen or so bands that played there, uh, uh, um, you know, Thor, uh, Dina Regine, um, uh, Trigger, Lover. Um, um, it was a whole bunch of bands that played there. Uh, Stars played there. Uh, uh, the Boys from Illinois played there. Mother Goose from from New Zealand. Uh, we we it was just a plethora, a, a huge melting pot. Of of all these bands, and that's where I hung out. Right. And and uh, from there, I I, I well I, I did from there, and then I dated a girl who worked at Electra Records, and she would help me with her, to her. I was rubbing shoulders with all the all the top labels. Right, right. And there was a band I worked with called Sterling. Uh, I brought to, I, I introduced her to them. Electra passed, but they got signed by A and M. So I, 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 heard was, I, was, I, I became I friends with the. With Hernando Cartwright, who was the uh, the A and R guy at A and M Records. Holy crap! One thing leads to another. I met this girl from Jersey. Well, who used to hang out there, and I started dating her, and and she would take me back to the clubs in Jersey when I wasn't in New York. Right. And I, one thing led to another. I don't remember the exact connection how this happened, but I got a phone call at her parents' uh, parents' apartment. Right. From this band called the E Walker Band, and they e were like, "Is that E Walker? E the E Walker? It was like e a, a letter E dot Walker. Yeah, yeah. E Walker had had been around for a long time. They were like, you have to understand the bands that were doing the Jersey and the New York club circuit, the, the tri-state club circuit, right? We're just like live jukeboxes. We're doing top forty, whatever was on the radio. Right, right, right. And and E Walker did everything from Joe Jackson to Judas Priest. Holy crap. Yeah, you know, and the Who, and the Doors, and and Led Zeppelin, uh, uh, um, whatever was was alternative, not alternative, but uh, uh, new wave. We yeah, did, new, did new every, age, new wave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, uh, they we now call it something else. Yeah. So they said, "Well, we're playing at the Orangeburg Pub, which is just across the Jersey New York state line. Uh, we want to talk to you." I said, "All right." So I came to meet them at the club. You know, me and me, the girlfriend went. He said, "Well, we got a, we got a, you, your name was referred to us. Here we go again." <laughs> uh, and they wanted me to replace the guy they had. And I didn't. I, I watched him. I didn't see anything wrong with the guy they had. He looked fine. You know, good-looking guy, dark curly hair. You know, Italian. You know, attractive. They said they gave me a list of the songs. This is a Sunday night. They said you, we're going to start you on Wednesday. That's like a day and a half. I had like 50 songs to learn. <laughs> you know, at least 50 songs. <laughs> These guys did four sets a night, you know, four uh 45 minute sets. Right, right, right. Talk about woodshop. Oh man. <laughs> it was like round the clock, learning these songs, round the clock, round the clock, round the clock. And and I went to the club uh uh, uh on Wednesday afternoon for you know, when they load in. And that's when they told the guy he was out of the band. They didn't even they they wanted to make sure I would show up first before they told him he was out. Oh, I see. So they told they told him right when I walked in. They saw me there, and he went over to him and said, "You're out of the band. We got a new guy." Oh, jeez. <laughs> and I I remember that because that, that could happen to me, and and kind of did almost. Um, it happens to everybody that's in. Yeah. But here's me again replacing their guy, and I didn't right. see any problem with their guy. But that was, I didn't. I wasn't privy to the inside of the band. So Mothers on on Route 23 in New Jersey was one of the biggest clubs in Jersey. It was in Wayne, which was like a really rich area, and and the clubs had several different stages, different rooms depending on what level of band you were. Right. So we we were like uh, one of the main rooms, and I was dressed in head to toe white spandex. 
You know, I, I look like Punky, Punky Meadows revisited. <laughs> and everybody in the crowd, nobody knew this was going to happen. And I get up on stage with the band and everybody, you remember the French Knights in, in uh, Monty Python, the Holy Grail? Oh, yeah. When they saw mm -hmm. the when they saw the wooden rabbit coming up the I hill. I love Monty, Monty Python. Great. They're, they're, they're pushing the white, the, the, um, the, the wooden Trojan rabbit up the hill. Right, right. <laughs> and and, and uh, I hope I can do this. The French Knight looks at it. Yeah, he goes like this, then he goes. <laughs> that's that's the best way I could describe. That's funny. <laughs> what the crowd did when I came out on stage, they all went. But wait a minute, you just had another guy the other day. Who's this? <laughs> it's like he changed bass players overnight. And and I did the best I could. They, you know, to to you know, uh, uh, fumbled my way a little bit through it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was that was that, that was nineteen eighty. So I was now an e-walker playing six nights a week, four, sometimes five sets a night. Back right. when shots were shots were 50 cents. You know, <laughs> it, it, it was get get drunk, drink some more, and watch the band. And the and the more we played, the more they drank, and everybody was happy. <laughs> things, weren't so did, as, things weren't quite as things weren't quite as expensive that, as you. I did yeah. that through 80 and 81, and I didn't have a car. I had no way to get around. You did a lot of shit without a car, it sounds like. Well, well I only had so much money to work with. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. I had an apartment. I had my own apartment in Jersey City. I was working at a mar uh, uh, marketing research company in Manhattan. Right. And playing the clubs at night. And and my, my girlfriend at the time would drive me to the club, drop me off. Sometimes she'd stay the whole night, but she had to work, too. Uh, she dropped me off. And she had a whole bunch, a network of friends, the girls, guys, mostly the girls. And she said, can you drop Rick off back home? Because they were all coming back into Jersey anyway. Can you drop <laughs> Rick off at the end of the night? Right. And we, were playing, we, we played till four in the morning. You know, you didn't start till 10 or 11 at night. You played till four in the morning. Well, yeah, let, let's, the let, well let's see if we can get you to L.A. You're, we're still in New Jersey. Let's yeah. see if we can. Let's see if we. When you came to Los Angeles, and and why? Why did you come to Los Angeles? What was your motivation? What What did you want to do? They put a gun in my head and said, "Get here or else." <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, when I when I when I uh, well, um, e, e Walker, we uh, we went well. We got a connection. We went up to Canada, and we and as the band Spitfire, we toured okay. through Toronto. We played the top five biggest clubs in Toronto, the, all the legendary clubs. Right. We were doing we did we, we did we did some originals. We were in the studio. We recorded like two cassettes worth of originals. You say Spitfire? That was the name of the band. Spitfire, yeah, okay. like the British Air British warplane. Gotcha. We, we were, and we had the biggest fucking tour booking agency uh, in Canada. I mean, nice. they booked Rush, Brian Adams, mm, uh, all okay. the biggest saga. So we were under, yeah. yeah, we were under the biggest biggest Canadian booking agency there was. So we come back to Jersey. Um, I left the band. Uh, it was it was getting kind of. I, I, sometimes you join a band and everybody smokes pot, and I don't. <laughs> That's like my band. I didn't smoke pot back then at all. And, and because I didn't smoke pot, I was just under the you know I wasn't quite part of the brotherhood. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, <laughs> and and there were some incidences that happened in Canada that that caused some friction between them and I, and they did some things that were not very cool. Right, uh, right, they, right, they right. called it a they called it a practical joke, and it was not very funny. And so I I left the band, and through the girlfriend meeting another other girl, uh, friends in the club, I got introduced to a guitar player named David Ferrara, who was on the uh, on Mike Varney's Shrapnel uh, series. Okay. Called U.S. Metal. U.S. Metal. U.S. Metal. Yeah, and he was on U.S. Metal Four, and he had a song, and I think it was called Aggressor or or something like that. Anyway, he and I, he's like a, he was like an Eddie Van Halen guitar player, and uh, and he was a Capricorn. I'm a Capricorn, so we got along right off. Are the you bat. are you a Capricorn? Because I was trying to figure I, that out. I am. I am an. Okay. I have an un unapologetic Capricorn. <laughs> okay. If anybody doesn't like anything about me, I'm a Capricorn. Deal when, with when it. When is your birthday, Rick? When is your birthday? <laughs> December twenty eighth. 28th, all right. So when Christmas comes, the relatives would go, here, this is for Christmas and your birthday. <laughs> yeah, you got cheated. You got cheated. Yeah, I live, I live, my birthday is in the shadow of a holiday. I got you. You know, so, that's sad. Anyway, so me and David get together, 
And we said, let's do the heavier stuff uh, uh, in the clubs. So we did Van Halen, Iron Maiden, uh, Rush, uh, um, Scorpions. like that. And, and I actually was able to sing lead on a couple of songs. Nice. You know, so while playing bass like that. And and so we were like the heavier version of a top 40 band. And we started pulling E. Walker's crowd away from them. <laughs> like that. He, I'm sure he when, liked that. That's when uh, one of my other jobs uh, in Manhattan, uh, in walked these kids who came from California to watch Twisted Sister play at some festival. What year was that, Rick? Uh I'm just curious what, what time. It was late summer of 80, 81. Was it 81? Holy smokes. 81. Late summer of 80. I was already out of the E. Walker band. Okay. And and uh, um, and they said, well, you obviously look like a rock rock star. So who are you? What do you do? And I said, you know, I'm a bass player. And they said, oh, we, we know a band back in California. You'd be perfect for it. I'm like, why would I leave New York to go to California? <laughs> and they were talking why about – they were talking about a band called Circus Circus. Circus said, Circus. Were, that... they, were they out of L.A.? I'm just curious. Yeah. I, I said, that's that's a hotel in Vegas. There's a band with the same that's name. That's also and... a club. That's a club in Hollywood. I played there called Circus Circus. Yeah. Well, anybody who uses the name usually gets contacted by the hotel and says, you can't use the name. <laughs> and that's what uh... happened to the band. They got contacted by the hotel. I mean, their logo was a tiger jumping through a hoop on fire. It, well, it sounds it was... like Circus Circus right there. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the so, hotel so, out uh, here in Las Vegas, where I'm at. They did. Yeah, they changed their name to Sister. Okay. Okay. And there was uh, several bands already out playing. And it was, it was White Sister. There was Twisted I Sister. White, I remember White Sister. Yeah. So, uh, uh, anyway, they said, "Well, can you give us a contact?" And we'll okay. tell the guy in we'll tell the guy in California. I went, all right, "All right." So I gave him a phone number. I gave him a little snapshot. I had a picture of my bag of me playing with E. Walker on stage. So you get kind of an idea what I looked like on stage. And uh, and that was it. I never heard back from them. I saw your cat. I saw your cat. What a beautiful yeah, cat! A, Savannah, Savannah likes to jump in my lap when I'm doing interviews. What a beautiful cat. I yeah, have I, a lot of animal lovers that watch this show, just so you know. Yeah. And and I I interviewed uh I interviewed uh Raven. Raven and Holly Rocks. They love their animals. You know, you know Mark Bowles, right? Mark Bowles. Yeah, yeah. Say hello, and, Savannah. Yeah. Hi Savannah. Say hi to the Dean Vaughn <laughs> Music Podcast Show. Look at that baby girl. Hi, oh, Janine. What, what a beautiful cat. What a beautiful <laughs> cat. Oh, my Thanks. gosh. Do you just she have one? Them. Just one pet? So, I have three. She, when when we got her, uh, all the cats were feral. So we were mm. rescued. Mm -hmm. uh, she likes to put her, her arms around you, and she buries her head in your neck under your hair. Oh, my gosh. And she does this little nuzzling thing. Because <laughs> when, when they're babies, if they're separated from their from the mother too soon, right. they they still maintain that uh, that I uh, I need to nuzzle thing. So you're the you're the mama. Uh, well, and the data, daddy. You're the, you're the data. Well, you know they were all all my wife's cats. She rescued them. So you had these cats when you were married. Oh yeah, before we were married. Before you're married. Okay. Yeah, we we got her in uh, I think 2008 or 2009. Oh my god. Are yeah, you in this? Are you in the same house you were married? Have you been there? The whole the same? Or did you guys? No, I'm in Missouri. I'm in Missouri. I'm not in, in California. Right, you're in Missouri. Yeah, and um, well, we, we had a we had a um, I had an apartment in in North Hollywood. Okay, and that's that was two two thousand. Tara came back into my. I Tara and I met in eighty three, when I was in Sin. Wow, wow, it was, you, it was just that is just out of Steeler. Oh my! I, gosh. I, I met her at the Troubadour. Holy smoke! So you've known her since eighty three. Th 37, 38 years. Yeah. Holy smokes! But, but we we dated loosely a couple of times in the eighties and nineties, but it's something for some reason didn't click. I don't know why. Was she kind of but, a first love for you, a, a first big? Uh, she was convinced that I was going. She was going to marry me. <laughs> That's all her girlfriend said. All she talks about was you. <laughs> and so after she we, we we she kind of walked out of my life for about five years, and then showed up again one day, and and uh. uh she looked like a cross between Jennifer Aniston and Lita Ford when she showed up at my door. Holy smokes, man. 
and and uh, one thing led to another, and she moved in. I, I said, you know, but we we dated. I said, never mind the dating. You want to move in, and she moved in. So we were living at my apartment, and then I, I uh, the, the 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 topic of red hair came up, and I said, would you be interested in going red? So she tried on a blonde, red wig in the store, and she looked at it, and her fuck, and it's it just your eyes pop. It was like a new frame on a on a, on a beautiful painting, wow. and she went okay, and she went red, and from then she was stayed red for the rest of our lives together. Uh, so she, uh, so loved, she so she had long hair, kind of like Alita oh, Ford. Yeah, like almost beautiful. down to her waist. Wow, wow, wow. It's beautiful, long red hair, green That's eyes. Mm. Uh, she had a she had a prominent nose. I used to tease her about, but you know what? <laughs> if you remember the old Sonny and Cher show. That yeah. was the brunt of a lot of jokes. Sonny was always making fun of Cher's nose. <laughs> I remember but I'm that. I'm telling you, I I love Tara's nose, and I told her that. I said yeah. it, it it defines your 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 features. Absolutely, it's very I was powerful. Thinking. Very powerful, you know. It's dead serious. Well, yeah. Tara was part Scottish well, and part Native American. Okay, just part, part that's Cherokee. A, that's a, that's a nice mix. I'm a little Scottish. I got a little Welsh and Dutch in me. Um, yeah. But Scottish, nothing wrong with that. And, and I'm a little itchy. Let me scratch it. Uh, itchy. <laughs> what, but, is you, what is what is what is your native heritage? Where, where you know what do you? I, I'm Polish on up? my father's Polish on my father's side. Uh, Swedish on my mother's. Okay. And as far as I know, that's it. Uh, my, my, my mother was was extremely attractive, uh, and and. Uh, uh, she originally she had dark hair, you know, big boobs, you know, the, that kind of. And she went mm -hmm. blonde. Said so she went blonde uh, for the rest of her life, uh, you know. But I'm I'm more like my dad than my mother. Gotcha, you know? gotcha. Well, let's bring you back to 1982 when you moved All back right. to LA. Back, you, let's uh, get back on, on the you point. Got, here. You got in sister. And, well, well, the, uh, and, I got. The, I was getting. I was getting phone calls. Okay. From, they actually handed off my phone number to this guy. Okay. In California. I started getting phone calls and he's convincing me to come to California and try out for his band. Gotcha. He said, we'll, we'll, we'll pay your flight. If it don't work, we'll pay you your flight back. I went, okay. All right. Fair enough. So I cut up one of my couches. I used the foam around one of my amp, my base amp heads, which, which went on the plane. Right. Uh, my girlfriend at the time uh, bought me, they had me, when I wasn't looking, at it, which was very difficult for them to do, um, <laughs> they, they managed to get my, I had, a, I had an Ibanez Destroyer, which was the Explorer body base. I remember that guitar. That we talked earlier about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they somehow snuck it away from me when I wasn't around, took it to, Pest, I think it was Pastore's Music in Jersey, Jersey City, and they had a custom-made anvil case made for a flight case. Nice. With, with the foam cut in the shape of the oh the, yeah the, they customized the yeah, yeah right yeah. so that was my my going away present the they presented case. me I got a brand new flight case for my base nice nice but the case I had was was broken gotcha so I gets on the plane I lands in Jersey and in, in uh, California LAX and I see this this head this much taller than everybody else coming through the crowd this black hair right. <laughs> And he's like six two, six three. It was Blackie Lawless. Oh my God! There's Blackie. That's who I got that was getting the phone calls from. <laughs> it was Blackie Lawless? I remember him. I met him once. So when we we originally initially talked on the phone, uh, um, well, I had a look, luckily I had boots on with his some heels on it because one of the things he asked me on the phone is how tall are you? Because everybody in this everybody in this band's tall. I say even the drummer the drummer's sitting down, you know. Anyway, uh, he shows up at the airport with uh, Randy Piper, guitarist. There it is, Randy, behind you. Uh, and Tony Richards, who you're blocking in the picture. Uh, Tony and, Richards. And also, I, okay. Yeah. I got you. And, and Blackie, Blackie had somebody who, who was his driver, was a guy named Mike Solon. Okay. Now, for you trivia buff people, Mike Solon is the brother of Eddie Solon, who was Ace Frehley's guitar tech and the Kiss's sound man. At the time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mike Solon is also the bartender in the Wasp video "Blind in Texas." Oh, ah, okay. When they walk in and say, "We're here to do a gig," and he goes, "What's a gig?" What's a and, gig? He, and he and he, pour, he pours the shot glass out on the bar, and the acid makes a burns into the bar. That's Mike Solon. Gotcha. Mike was Mike was the guy that would pick us up at Blackie's. I would stay at Blackie's house. He picked us up 
drove us to rehearsal, stayed there, and then drove us back until Blackie's car got fixed. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So, so that was my my meeting of the of those guys at the at the airport at LAX. And uh, the first one of the first memories I have is to drive back from LAX to into Hollywood, and they had the window open on the car, and I could smell the sweet sweet air i said what is that smell they said that's and this is uh this is february 4th 1982 right and they said that's the beginning of the blossoming of the orange blossoms oh. in, in, in california the orange blossoms open up and the air was so sweet and I'm like wow palm trees and all right it's a little bit a little bit of paradise here or something i guess <laughs> i don't know so anyway, so they dropped me off at Blackie's house. Randy and Tony took my gear to Randy's uh, rehearsal studio in, in Anaheim. And we talked, Blackie, we talked all night. You know, we have to wear off the jet lag, blah, blah, blah. Right. Well, the next night, he took me to um, the Troubadour. That was my first time walking into the Troubadour. Are we still talking uh, about Blackie? Still... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kevin DeBro was the first rock star I met in, in, in the in the lobby of the Troubadour. Oh wow! Tell me, welcome, welcome to L.A. Watch your back because everybody's got a knife for it. <laughs> well, Kevin, Kevin was was had a reputation for uh, calling it like it is, being a straight mm. shooter, and he, he held no pulled no punches. And if he says he says this place is this L.A. is a viper's nest. Everybody mm. wants a job, mm -hmm. and if you're not paying, it, 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 you know they'll do anything they can. To, to 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 get your job it's in a very aggressive market you know very aggressive yeah, industry. yeah yeah i, I, I found kind of like out. models you know women and in, in when they're you know in uh pageants you hear the same story they're vicious I, I i found out what la was like the hard way yeah so so anyway they said what are you doing here so i'm, I'm auditioning for blackie's band and he went oh uh okay oh well, good luck with that <laughs> uh, so amongst amongst the crowd we met i walked there's david lee roth at the bar <laughs> like, wow, I just saw Van Halen at the Palladium in 78. Right. I got I got I got Dave's towel. I was like, uh so here's David Lee Roth in your in, in front of your naked steaming eyes, 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 in the flesh, 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 flesh. Uh and it's 1970, only 1978, Van Halen, had they already recorded all the albums or that was early? It was, it was 78, 79. I know they they had just played the Palladium in New York. Okay. That was still so okay. I, it, I just saw them like a couple of years before that. Here gotcha. he is, right in front. Of, he's right there in front of me, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, like that. Hey, how you doing, man? I'm here for the duration, you know. <laughs> right. Check you out. Where are you from? You know? <laughs> New guy on the uh, block. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's that. And then uh, um, Blackie goes, you know what? Let's go up to the Rainbow. I said, what's that? He goes, that's that's like the big club where everybody hangs out. I yeah. said, this is a club. Everybody's hanging. I go, try. we went up to the Rainbow, <laughs> legendary Rainbow Bar and Grill. I know the, the Rainbow. Moving, the home of the moving stars. What year was that, Rick? That was 18. I'm telling you, this is like, uh, uh, fourth, this had to be February 5th, 1982. Oh, okay, 80s, early 80s. Okay. Yeah, it was the night after I arrived from from, from Jersey. Okay, so he took you down to the Rainbow Bar and so Grill. He took me to the Rainbow. On Sunset Boulevard, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and 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 so uh, um, uh, who knows? She's there's Punky Meadows. He's like, hey Rick, what are you doing here? You know? Oh my He's god, like, you met I him already all. met him. Yeah. I already met Angel several times. Gotcha. In New York gotcha. after their shows. How funny. Uh, uh, Michael Diamond from the band Legs Diamond uh, was there. Uh, uh, I got to. I was like, wow, there really is a lot of stars here. So <laughs> Blackie, Blackie and I sit down. We get a table. Welcome to Hollywood. Yeah. Now go home. <laughs> uh, we, we, get a, we, we get a table and who comes walking down the aisle sits himself down next to Blackie David fucking Lee Roth David Lee Roth now he's sitting at our table you know it's like one of those pinch me <laughs> moments was was he an asshole back then too Rick no he was, he was you know David walks in the room and he owns it you know he's, he's yeah, the center yeah. of the, oh. he's, the, he's the MC he always he's has the been ring, always has the been the ringmaster yeah, no. yeah, he's the ringmaster, like that. And it's, it's, it's you know the smile. He's always smiling and like, yeah, hey, I'm, hey, yeah. <laughs> I'm the rightest bulb in the room, man. You uh -huh. can't go wrong. Yeah, he's the only one in the room. He's the only one. <laughs> how many? How many people does it take to unscrew a David Lee Roth light bulb? You don't need to. He's got a road crew. <laughs> he came to see me play a couple times. Actually, I was playing back in Hollywood. I was yeah, singing with Danger at the time. 
Yeah, yeah. Good times. So, so anyway, so uh, now we get down to business. The next night, we go down to the studio, and uh, this is now where we get into audition mode. Oh, look, that's a that's a tall yard of beer you got going there. Uh, all right, yeah, it, so, it is yours. <laughs> yeah, so I, so I've got a pills in a glass like that, so I know. Well, uh, break it out. I'll give you a break. <laughs> I, I, I can't, I'm, I'm drinking coffee. I can't be all drinking beer. All right, all right. I got you in Jersey, no. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I sit down, and 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 they plug in, and they run through five songs. And, and the only way I can describe this is I'm, I'm it's 1972, 73, and I'm sitting back in the loft watching Kiss. It was that kind of electric power. Right, right. I sat there in my mind, and I'm going, "Can I, can I say what what I need to say? Is this a different? Well, you can say edit? anything yeah. you want. Go ahead." I said, holy shit. You know, I mean, these guys were loud. They were loud like Deep Purple loud, like Kiss loud. And they played uh, um, uh, On Your Knees, uh, um, School yeah. Days. Oh, yeah, I remember that. B.A.D., uh, um, Sleeping in the Fire. Sleeping in the Fire. And uh, 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 Hellion. Hellion. Hellion, yeah. yeah that yeah. was the five, the five songs. I just sat there. It was like my hair went woo, <laughs> like sitting in front of a front of a, a, a giant jet behind a seven forty seven. And it feels so good. Yeah, it did. And he says, "All right, come on up, plug in." And they they showed me the songs, and I I, I worked my way through them. Uh, I I'm a I'm a melodic player, right? Okay, I hear that. I, I hear that. I, 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 my influences, you know, uh, uh, Pete Way, uh, um, uh, um. What else? Um, my answer was Humble Pie, Grand Funk Railroad. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, um, great bands, great bands. Bands whose bass players don't just play one note. You know, uh, Stanley you know, Clark. Sure. I'm thinking of uh, who am I thinking of? Bass players. Uh, Stanley Clark. I had a bass player in, in in my band, and he was he was Dixie Dregs. He yeah. was really into the Dixie Dregs, man, and he yeah. had a fretless P bass, Fender P bass, natural wood. Fretless bass. Mm. Oh, he played the shit out of it. And he was in the Dixie Dregs. That was my bass player for 14 yeah. years. Okay. Cool. 14 years, yeah. So so my influences were guys that would play a melodic bass line. I mean, if you look, you listen to what Gene Simmons playing, he's copying Paul McCartney. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? I mean, Kiss, the early Kiss was kind of like a, a heavy metal version of the Beatles. Kind of was. Kind of was. You know, it was all about the harmonies and the melody and ooh, ooh, ooh. And, and, and so <laughs> right. that was kind of, that was Anthem. where. Anthem, kind of. Exactly. And so yeah. I plug in and I'm, I'm trying to catch the pockets where I can put a little walk in there. So, and Blackie's going, can you play simpler? <laughs> it's, it wanted to break you down to a, a standard bass. bass Blackie, it's three, it's three chords. How much simpler can I play? Right. You know. So and, and to, so, you were trying to give it a little bit of melodic edge on the bass. To make side. a long story longer, uh, the, the whole audition process was two days. It was February sixth, then a break, and then February eighth. Okay. And I, it didn't take much to get those five songs down. They're really simple. Right, right, right. So, suffice to say, he says to me, "All right, you got the gig. You're in the band." Now this and is Wasp. So, we're, we're talking about Wasp. No, it was called Sister. I'm sorry, Sister. Gotcha. Right. Uh, he had sat down and said, okay, now that we got a bass player and then, and I started writing with him, we, I, I added a sixth song we worked on called master of disaster, master of disaster. And I was, I was writing some lyrics That's a great and I had name. a kind of an idea and we worked it out we brought it into rehearsal and we started doing master of disaster. Ye all these years, decades later. The fans, the Wasp fans said, you know, Master of Disaster sounds a little bit like Wild Child. The verses sound exactly the same. I said, Blackie's never a guy to throw out a good idea. He probably Frankenstein the song, changed the lyrics. <laughs> right. And Wild Child was probably Master of Disaster. Right, right, right. So if you play the two side by each, you'll hear the, the, the similarities like that. So anyway, so now we're doing six songs. Rehearsal. We get down there whenever we can because either Mike had to be able to drive us. Right. Oh, so, um, 
go ahead and repeat that part. Yeah, uh, uh, we had whenever we could get a ride down to rehearsal because Randy Randy had an industrial space rehearsal room. Okay. Uh, uh, the first drum riser on the left was was uh, as you go in the room was a band called Exciter. That was okay. George Lynch, George Lynch and Mick Brown. I remember before, Exciter way back. Be, this was before before Dokken. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Then there was another drum riser here. There was another drum riser there, another drum riser there, and then we were right in the center in the back of the room. Okay. okay. And it was a huge room, gigantic, like a showroom, and all the walls were carpeted all the way up <laughs> to the ceiling. Wow. Like that. And and, and he had his office in, in the front, and in his uh, where he would sleep was upstairs over his office. But Randy was going out with um, uh, uh, Cindy, who at the time was the singer of the Orchids. Oh, man, I remember that name. He was he was originally married to Bell Piper, who passed away. Uh, yeah. She became a friend of mine. She was the one who told me, "Watch out for Blackie." Uh, <laughs> right. well, welcome to L.A., but watch out for Blackie. Yeah, but but you know, so so Randy is now with with Cindy with, from the Orchids, and uh, and that's that's you know, this was in Anaheim. This is like just in the shadow of Disneyland, and so this is where we rehearsed, <clears throat> and so we're, we're we're doing these songs. Uh, now we go back to Blackie lived in Hollywood, uh, right off Las Palmas. Right. And, and, um, he had a rental college cottage in this, this uh, courtyard. And, and so, uh, there's a gigantic avocado tree. I'm walking, I get a phone call from somebody from New York and I'm, I walk outside with the phone. He had a really long extension cord. <laughs> he, you need he, one. He's, he, he's in his house. It's in the apartment. He's like this. <laughs> watching the Yankees game on the TV. Who is? Black. Oh, Black is. <laughs> I mean, we're both from New York. He's a big Yankees fan. Okay, okay. He was going to play baseball when he was younger. Ah, I'd like to hear that story, too. So, so, uh, well, the re here, let me put this in perspective. The reason Blackie was in L.A. in the first place is he got tagged to, to, to uh, the last, the very last two shows of the New York Dolls Red Patent Leather Tour. Right. Johnny Thunders had so much heroin in him, he couldn't play. Oh, wow. They got Blackie. I forget exactly how they got Blackie. They, they, they showed him the songs real quick. They teased up his hair like Johnny, and they <laughs> stood on the side of the stage. So from a distance, it looked like Johnny Thunders playing guitar. Oh. <laughs> so out of that, Blackie became friends with Arthur Kane. Oh. Arthur Killer Kane. Gotcha. Uh, uh, and when the dolls broke up, Blackie formed Killer Kane with Arthur. Gotcha. That's how he stayed in L.A. and and they did they did a they did one forty five or one single. They played a little bit, but they didn't get that much anything going for them. So Arthur came went up and back to New York. Blackie stayed in L.A. So that's where he had formed Circus Circus. He had formed Sister. The guy had several different lineups with membership changes. Gotcha, like that. But he was also starting to try and introduce his version of shock rock to the audience. And they were playing with uh, uh, witchcraft type uh, uh, symbolism. Right. The logo, the logo was an upside down pentagram that had fire in it. Uh, um, not to be the, confused with the, satanic. The, not to be confused. Exactly. With, well, yeah. well, satanic and witchcraft is two different things. Two different technically. things. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, witchcraft is like a pagan earth religion. Satan is, Satanism is like an egotistical uh, uh, takeover kind of power thing. Gotcha, gotcha. So he was playing with all of this imagery, and the candles, and and daggers, and the, there was a there was a, 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 a an occult supply store on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood, where he would go and, and buy some of these things that would uh, 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 these visual things that would you know like that, and then he he got onto this thing about. He found out about uh, um, he come on stage with a bit with a black box that said bait. Bait. And in the bait box, we call them bronco worms. What they were was gigantic earthworms. Oh, my God. They were as thick as my finger and about 12, <laughs> 12 inches long. I like to go fishing with some of those things. And that bait box would sit on the drum riser. Right. <laughs> and some part of the show, he'd go over there. I shit you not. He pulled this. Well, I, I have a picture of it somewhere, <laughs> and he's like this, and he's holding oh, no. the over his face, and he opens his mouth, 
and in goes the worm. Oh, ouch. The whole worm. <laughs> and he ate the oh, worm. He ate it. Oh, is it alive? Right down, his, right down his throat. Is it alive? Yes. It's Holy. wriggling. <laughs> now, picture the look on the face and the, the faces in the audience. Oh, oh my God. It's it's like when Ozzy Osbourne, right? When he did, did, I, did I see what I thought I just saw? This guy just put a giant worm in it down his throat. Oh, my gosh. And, and he, he said... Uh, uh, I forget he, the name of the he, did he did he eat the worm? I mean, did he yes. spit it? He didn't yes, spit it he out. Ate, he ate live worms oh. on stage. <laughs> he said he said essentially earthworms are, are they're protein. They're protein, yeah, yeah. So you're not gonna you're not gonna get sick eating an earthworm. And they're not, and they're not gonna. It's going, <laughs> it's going through your intestines, man. It's gross. And it's still alive. Yes, it's gonna live for a while. So the drummer from this punk band, uh, oh, Captain Jesus. Captain Avi, whatever it is, they Captain uh, <laughs> name of the guy. Uh, he walks up to the front of the stage. Blackie tells the story. This guy walks up to Captain Sensible. He walks up. To the, <laughs> Captain walks Sensible. Walks up to the front of the stage. He looks down at a piece of broken worm on the ground on the, on the stage. <laughs> right. Blackie says, "I watched him reach in his pocket. He pulls out a gum wrapper, a foil gum wrapper." Picks up the worm, puts it in the gum wrapper, folds it, puts it in his pocket, goes back into the crowd. Oh my gosh, no! Yeah. <laughs> so one of the one of the stage effects they had was Blackie had a mannequin on the stage, and he would shoot the mannequin with a flare gun. Well, he shoots the mannequin with the flare gun. It deflects off the mannequin, goes up the stairs of the whiskey, and hits some girl in the face. Oh no! <laughs> By the grace of God. She wasn't that. She wasn't that badly burned. They got it. They got her. You know, uh, and she didn't sue. Well, thank God for that. Yeah. So this is some early Blackie, real Blackie Lawless stories of what he told me. So he says we can't do all this stuff anymore. To, to bring you back on point, we need a new name. This is a new band. I need a new concept, and I don't know where I'm going to pull it out of my ass. Here, enter Rick Fox. This is the, my hand to God. This is the story. This is how it happened. I'm out in the courtyard on the phone, walking around, and I'm kicking over leaves from the avocado tree. Right. I, and I tapped over a leaf and I saw what looked like a yellow jacket. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, and they're scavengers. They go after anything that's sweet. So I, my instinct quick was I step on it and I kicked the leaf over again and it, I didn't kill it completely. It's it's half dead and and the tail the stinger you can see the stinger going like this oh yeah 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 you know, like that and I and I immediately went oh my god I just got a flash you remember in the sixties Batman Adam oh, West yeah yep you remember their competition show um refresh my memory the Green Hornet the Green Hornet and what yeah. was the logo of the Green Hornet was that the Hornet Mm -hmm. With the tail, yep. and it had that psychedelic pattern behind I remember, it. I remember that. Yeah, absolutely. that's what clicked in my head was that that Green Hornet logo. I goes back in the house. Blackie's like just on the on the on the seat. Watch. I said. I looked down. I said. I got an idea for a band name. What? <laughs> I said. Wasp. I said. I just stepped on one outside. I said. Think about it. Wasp. He goes. He's looking at the ceiling and goes, looks at me, he goes, that's a good idea. He, he, actually like liked, he actually liked it. He's he thinking like that. I go back outside. He goes back to watching the game. Next time we go to rehearsal, when rehearsal's over, he gathers, you know, Randy and Tony and me, and we got a new name for the band. Randy goes, well, what, 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 you know, I want to call the band Hellion. Because that's what we that's what we call bad kids in Texas. A little hell yeah. <laughs> I says, I think there's a band in Hollywood already using that name. Right. He's like, oh, oh shit. So Tony goes, Well, what's the name? Blackie goes, Wasp. Tony always had this look on his face like like something smelled bad. He, he wasn't laughing. He was because he he drank a lot. So Tony goes, Wasp? Who names a band after a bug? <laughs> I said, the Beatles. <laughs> scorpion good good response good what's response. scorpion's logo it's a scorpion it's Fucking a bug scorpion. yeah the scorpion it's an arachnid yeah arachnid. So, so Black, goes, well, 
that's what the name of the band is. It's called Wasp now. So technically, I, I think you and your, your 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 followers would have to agree on a technicality. At that moment, Wasp was born, and we are all four co-founders of a new band. Right? It sounds like it, yeah. Logic being, you know, logic dictates. That's that's kind of where that was the that was the uh, spark. The end, the initial point of the create the board that what was born at that moment. How ironic! Was, how ironic is was, that? This was uh, Mar of February, March. This had to be March near the end of March of of eighty two. Well, you you've so, got May, you got May nineteen eighty two, and uh, or February of nineteen eighty two, and the end of May of eighteen nineteen. Well, I was I was in the band from the beginning of February to the end of May. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So, so by March, you know, we're already rehearsing. You already uh, came into the band by this point, right? I, I'm in the band at this point. Gotcha. Uh, which, which he denies. And if, 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 if I was out of the band after one or two auditions, how do you explain me living in his house for four months? <laughs> right. And then go what's going out to the clubs and hanging out for four months. Okay. You know, and, 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 and how ironic that it became an acronym, Wasp. Well, that came later. Uh, uh, now that we got the band name, uh, he got a tape recorder, and we went down to Randy's uh, studio, and he got an old reel-to-reel, -reel, right? and we re we recorded all six songs live, in the air, no overdubs. He'd, he'd hit record, go, go go grab his guitar, mm -hmm. and, and like that, and that's what oh. we did. And we got, we got the six songs down on tape, and then he calls up uh, this local photographer, Don Atkins. Who, who who shot Motley Crue? He should, they were hanging at the Starwood. He was shooting all these bands. I think I know who that is. Yeah, Don. Go, he goes, Don. I got a, I got a bass player. We got a band. Let's do a photo session. Don goes, okay. So we go to Don's parents' house, and I think it was uh, uh, not Whittier, uh, something, something, and somewhere in Orange County, like Arnold. Uh, okay, Cerritos. I think it was in Cerritos. Cerritos, yeah. And we did a photo session. And, and uh, you know, we didn't really have an image yet. We just dressed whatever we could grab, rock and roll type clothing. And if you look at that picture, they all look like, they look like hammer, saw, nails. And then you look at me, milk. <laughs> what doesn't belong in this picture? I'm going to have to show that picture. I got this, I got this Punky Meadows pretty boy look. Right, right, right. And these right. guys, these guys look making faces like criminals. <laughs> Blackie's going, ah, Randy's going, hmm, Tony's going, uh, you know, and there's me going, and you're, ah, you're, you know, you're pretty, pretty boy, pretty boy Floyd over there. Yeah, I'm telling you. Well, you, you know, so, you were, that, you were a pretty boy back then. I'll tell you. Uh, well, you, I look well like had, my mother then. I, I guess I look. Yeah. <laughs> any, anyway, so, so we're, in, you know, that's pretty much where it was at. And then uh, uh, towards the end of May, sometimes. People who started, I become friends with, would come by the house, pick me up, and take me out to the clubs. Right. <laughs> so there was this guy Donovan who was one of he worked for Lita Ford. He's one of the roadies for Lita Ford. This guy somehow managed to finagle a limousine. Comes by the house, picks me up. We go down to the Troubadour. Who gets in the limo? Tommy Lee, uh, Vince Neil. And and uh, one of the girls who was a bartender at the Troubadour. And we're driving around. We're partying in this limousine. Uh, I had a little too much to drink because it was a bar in a limousine. <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, I got, I got sick. Drink, I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm sitting across from Tommy Lee's like that. And I'm look, I look like it's going to come up any minute. <laughs> Tommy's going. Tommy's trying to back away. He's going, dude, dude, don't hurl on me. Don't no, hurl. no. <laughs> We, we you know, me, over me, and, me, and, me and Tom went to high school together, just so you know. I know Tom really yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we pulled up some Beverly Hills. Somebody's probably, I ran up to the bushes and I, I purled my guts out. Oh, jeez. So, uh, so the, the, uh, the girl came over. She's you okay. You okay. And, and like that, got me back in the car, uh, brought me back to Blackie's house. Blackie's now yelling at Donovan for getting me drunk. <laughs> but that's my investment. What that's are you my, doing to this guy? That's my asset over there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he's yelling at, yelled at Tommy, he yells at Vance. I'm like, hey, we're, we had nothing to do with it, man. He, you know. <laughs> Messing with my like, bass player. Yeah. And and then that's when I got I got hit with my first kidney stone. I never had a kid as a picture. Oh, I never man. had a kid. Uh, I, I never, I didn't know what, what happened. I felt this hot sword going through my side. Blackie took me to the hospital. 
they did examination. He said, oh, he's got a kidney stone. Mm, so I had right. I had to stay in over. I got to say, to his credit, he took care of me with that. Uh, uh, you know, he, he made sure I was okay. Didn't it didn't abandon me or anything like that. And and uh, I got out of the hospital. I went back to his house, and I, uh, it eventually, you know, I, I peed it out, so it was gone. You got but, lucky. You got lucky on that. Yeah, one. yeah. But the thing is, uh, um, when I go out to the clubs, you know, I didn't have any a, a place of my own, and if a girl. We you know you, the, the you know they remember the Rainbow Park a lot at two in the morning. Everybody's outside picking up, hooking up with somebody else. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And so you know, I, I, I met, there were there were girls who were interested enough to want to go home with me. I can imagine. I can imagine and, and that. Was, Rick. You know, it wasn't all the time. You know, hit or miss. You know, and I was new in town, so that would that would made me interesting because I was new. Yeah, but you were the hottest. You were the hottest musician. Yeah, in the hall. I don't Come know about on. that. It was, the women know, were chasing you. you. You're going to deny that, that the women were chasing yeah, you. Yeah, I, I don't know about people. <laughs> I don't mean, it wasn't like the Beatles at the beginning of Hard Day's Night. <laughs> there was no you're, crowds chasing me. You're, you're a humble man. Yeah, well, I, I, thank you. <laughs> uh, and so there was one or two girls on different occasions right. was, that would say, well, you know, let's let's go home you know, together. And if I didn't go to their place, well, they where would they come then? Back with me to Blackies. There you go. Turns out one of these girls, uh, and there's a lot of dots to connect with this girl. Um, uh, she, I found out later, Blackie tried to pick her up earlier in the evening. <laughs> and she said no. So he got turned down. She comes home with me. Well, guess what? This is the girl that said no to him. Now I'm bringing her into his house. Oh no! <laughs> I just I just did something really bad. It's like but a man bro code that broke the bro code. Who knew? You don't. You know. see, yeah. I had no idea that had already transpired earlier in the evening. <laughs> and after after the well after the fact, I says to her, "Did Blackie try to pick you up earlier that night?" She goes, "Oh yeah, I told him. I told him no, no, I wasn't interested." Uh, now I start to put two and two together, which matched up to what, Ra what Randy told me after Chris had joined Wasp and they played the Troubadour because we right. were at an after we were at an after party. Uh, so Blackie Blackie stops talking to me for a couple of days. He's like being real distant, real cold, and uh, and uh, uh, he says a uh, certain time of the month we shut off all the cur close the curtains, make it look like nobody lives here. I said why he goes. But what he does is he he was so broke that he knew how to go out to his uh, uh, utilities, his electric meter, and they didn't have a lock on them yet. He would unscrew the bezel, the glass cover, and he would dial the numbers back to what it was the month before, <laughs> and put the deep, and put the glass cover back on. Oh my so god! So when they come to do the, to, when they come to read the meter, it would read the, the same number it was the month before. <laughs> But meanwhile, back at the office, it's like, wait a minute, something's not adding up here. We're seeing power being used, but the numbers are the same as the month before. So they started to put a lock on the collar. Oh, that's <laughs> so. I said, "Where did you find out about that?" He said, "I got this book called by Abby Hoffman called Steal This Book." Steal this book. And Abby Hoffman was a big counterculture hippie guy, right? And he found well, he found ways of. Uh, of of getting getting free this and free that and steal this and steal that. Wow. So Blackie, that's where he. So Blackie was essentially stealing free utility and gas uh, uh, from you know because that's how broke we were. He was he was making uh, uh, stage monitors and fog machines and selling them through uh, the recycler newspaper. He was I, living in. I think that's about the time I met Blackie. He was working at like at a guitar shop or something. I'm not sure. He was living. He was living hand to mouth. Right. You know, and and I had a day job set up in Century City that fell through. By when I got there, they said we can't just create an opening. You're gonna have to wait until we have one. So there goes my pocket. You know, so whatever money, he, whatever paltry money he made. Now, were you living with Blackie at that time? Were you living with oh, him? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was staying in his house. You were his roommate. Yeah. Well, yeah. He, well, he had a loft up by the ceiling in his his uh, uh, his cottage. Gotcha. And and he had a ladder that went up to it. I was sleeping on the floor, 
But out, if you go outside the house and you climb this ladder, there was a deck up there and another another room that had no door on it. So he, he got wood and he built a door. Now I had my own room, but it was all ex exposed beams gotcha. and stuff. And, and he, he went to recycle it. He bought me like a, a, a little, like a single mattress. And I got a blanket and a pillow. And that's where I, I was sleeping in there. Upstairs. So, uh, typical, so typical of the musician living in L.A. or Hollywood. Yeah, so, so I was living just, just, just off the deck. Right. So uh, he says, you know what? It ain't working out. Tony's not happy. Randy's not happy. So I said, what about the demo? Well, it's just not working out. It's just. I remember he, he just kept saying it's not working out. He goes, "Well, you can't stay here, but he goes if you want, we'll fly you back to uh, to, to to New York. But if you really want to make it, being here is your best shot. But you can't stay here. You're out of the band." I was like, "I never saw it coming." Just, here's the kick, just, here's the here's the kicker. Just like that. Give me back all of the pictures of the band. They're not yours. I said, "Why? I'm in the I'm in the P." He goes, "Those are my pictures. I paid for them." So he wanted me. He wanted to take away the proof that I was in the band. Oh, that's ridiculous! So when he went out, I took the negatives up to Sunset Boulevard to a printing place, and I had more pictures printed. And when I got back, I stashed a couple of them. Luckily, when I went in the house, he went. He goes, "Where's the negatives?" So I, I showed him. I here, here. I handed him the negatives, and he goes, "I want the pictures." So I handed him a couple that I had in my hand. And 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 he was he was livid. This guy was ballistic, yelling at me. I said, "You can't have those pictures. That's my pictures. It's my band. Blah blah. My 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 my." Jesus! Wow. Well, if I didn't stash those pictures, which one of which you have there, there would be no way for me to prove that I was in the band. Well, so this yeah, is, this but you is, were, yeah, is, but you were in the band, and those those pictures. Who took the pictures? I mean, who who gets exclusivity over pictures? I mean, how does that work? Uh, well, Don took the pictures, Don Atkins, but but Blackie Blackie said he paid for them, so they, uh, ergo they belong to him. Okay, that's his, his, his property. So so now I'm out of the band. I had no place to go. Wow, essentially, wow. out on the streets for a living. <laughs> pictures only begun. And you've had a rough road, bro. Back, in, but you know, tell tell me things got better from there. They had to have. Woo, 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 where's Ricky gonna go now? <laughs> so I, okay. I, I, what? One of the girls that I made friends with, right? She lived at the apartment building. Her apartment, her apartment wall was right across from from Motley Crue. Okay. She was an S. She she was like a a, a connection for an escort agency. Okay. So these are all these are all escorts that worked for Madame Alex and Heidi Fleiss. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, essentially, arm candy for for rich clients. Heidi Fleiss was big back in the day. She had a cool yeah. 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 So her name was Roxy. Oh, that's not her real name, but her, she went by the name Roxy. Everybody back in the scene knew who she was. It was eleven forty North Clark Street. It was the party building, and her apartment was right next door to Motley Crue. Mm. And that's where I met Tommy. Uh, that's where I met Nikki, and, and like that. Uh, so she said, you know what? Hell with the hell with Blackie. She goes, come and stay at my place. She had a huge two-bedroom apartment with a gigantic pit couch. So I stayed there, and, and I took care of the place. You know, I, I vacuumed the carpets. I did the dishes. Yeah. You know, I, I, made, I, made use, I was like Jerry Lewis in The Houseboy. <laughs> and and uh, when the girls would come back with their money, they said, well, I need a place to stash my money. So I'd hide, I'd hide it for them, you know, and they come back later and they go, where's my money? And I go get their money and I give them the account. And they go, okay, thank you. Like that. And, and that was where I, uh, now, now I'm trying to network and meet other musicians because, right. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a stranger in a strange land, like the book. <laughs> right. And so I, I auditioned for the Greg Leon invasion. Oh, I remember Greg Leon. Greg, Greg was one of the loudest guitar players. Greg was one of the original members in Dokken before George Lynch. Wow. Okay. I think you know, he. I think he played in Germany with with Don. And then I auditioned for um, Rat. Did you uh, did, I, did you play with him at all, or just audition? no 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 no? I, we we audition, I auditioned for Rat at, at Stephen Piercy's grandmother's garage, in, <laughs> in in Culver City. 
And uh, uh, Bobby before Blocker, anybody before anybody yeah, knew who Rat was, probably right. Yeah, well, I I, I knew I, I knew that they played around the clubs. Right, I mean, we'd already right. seen I seen Rat, uh, and they I was they they got rid of their bass player Gene, and they didn't have Juan yet. So and Juan was busy with with Don Dawkin, and and Vic forgot. So uh, I went and auditioned for for Rat. I got along great with with Piercy and with uh, uh, Warren and and Robin. Okay. Lots had an issue with me because I didn't play with my fingers. I was using a pick. And Blossom goes, "Hey man, I don't even finally put a bass player to play with their fingers, man." I said, "Look, I don't tell you what kind of drumsticks to use." <laughs> so don't be telling Bobby, me about how I did. Bobby Blotzer play with Wasp as well, right? You no, no. no. Uh, well, before it was Wasp, while it was still Sister, here's okay. what happened. Uh, Gary Holland was playing with Blackie, and Tony Richards was in Dante Fox with Jack Russell and Mark Mark Kendall. Oh yeah, brings back okay. memories. Yeah. So they, uh, this is I've talked to Gary about this, and it's in it's in the book Wasp Sting in a Tail. Right. Uh, it, it's an unofficial autobiography about Wasp. Gary said he couldn't get along with Blackie anymore. He said the, the guy's a jerk. I, I can't stand him. So Gary left sister and joined Dante Fox with Jack Russell and Mark Kendall and Tony left them and joined Blackie. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's how that happened like mm -hmm. that. And then, and then uh, uh, Dante Fox became, as we know, great white. Okay. And, and that's how they swapped drummers. And, oh, and so, yeah. So anyway, yeah, Adi, so Adi's I, now playing with him. Yeah. Adi. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to network and, and meet other musicians and whatnot i saw motley crew at the at the, at the whiskey uh, with metallica opening and Met i watched metallica get booed really uh, I, I saw rat i saw rat with uh jakey lee and i saw rat with mark Turin. it mm -hmm. was like a revolving door every other week there was a new guy yeah. in the band right right <laughs> and then i said warren was in the band so i got to see a lot of a lot of like Blackie said, I, I it was the hot time to be in la 1982 when yeah. everybody was starting to come up yeah, everybody was it was getting hot. Yeah, Van Halen, everybody. Yeah, and then uh, somebody recommended a band called Warlord, so I went and auditioned, and I played with them for two, three, four months, and and uh, and and I said, well, when are we going to play out live? We get a singer. We're gonna, and they said, we're not playing live. This is a recording. This is like a, a, a an album project. And I went, well, guys, I I, I want to play live. I said, right. well, we're not going to play live. So I said, well, thank you, but you should have told me that four months ago. Thank you. Good night. And I, I left. Right. And then I put an ad in. I had already moved out of Roxy's at this point. Uh, uh, I had an apartment with, with the kid who handed off my number to Blackie. We lived, we lived. Uh, if you know Hollywood, we lived around the corner from Cantor's Deli by La, by La Brea. I, I think love Cantor's. I've been there a few times. Fairfax, right off of yeah. Fairfax. Yeah, I know. And and uh, I, I put an ad in Music Connection magazine. I said, you know, bass player new in town. Uh, I, I I know, you know I've, I know Kiss. I knew Thor. I know, you know stuff from back in New York. People in LA. There's no way to no way to check your references. It was no internet. Uh, right. So the mouth, word of mouth, and local local man. I, I got I got yeah. I got contacted by Ron Keel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now now I I had seen Steeler the original lineup at the Roxy. When we had the guys from Nashville, that was his original band, and and uh, me and Eric, I was hanging out with Eric Carr from Kiss, and we were watching Steeler. Steeler said, "I mean, uh, 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 Eric says to me, hey, you know, you know, you know that girl Bambi." I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Can you introduce me to her?" I said, "Sure, no problem." Bambi is is the girl that I told you about earlier that Blackie tried to pick up in the club, and she turned him down. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> okay. While I was staying at Roxy's apartment, we're still in 1982. Uh, she had taken a quaalude <clears throat> and she was she was in Roxy's bathroom taking a bath. Right. I can hear her talking from the other side of the room. I wasn't in the room, I, but I could hear her talking. And she's starting to slur her words as the, as the quaalude is starting to set in. Oh, no. <laughs> and then I, she stops talking. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm like, hey, Bambi, you, uh, you still awake? And it's nothing. So, so Dean, I, I run in, I go in the room, and she did a Whitney Houston 
and she slid under the water. Oh no! And there's bubbles coming up. Oh no! And she's under the, completely under the water. Oh jeez! So I grabs her real quick. I picks her up out of the tub, and I brings her and I drop her on Roxy's bed. And I'm shaking her, trying to get the, the water out of her mouth. Uh, right. You know, oh. like 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 a little CPR thing going there. Right, right, right. And and you know, and I throw a towel over her and I'm like that. Uh, and and so uh, uh, she starts to come to. Oh, and she's so going, oh, she looks up and she goes, oh, you saved my life. Oh, I was, I would have fell asleep under the water. like, that. And, and so essentially I was in the right place at the right time. I saved her life. Oh my gosh. If she had have died in Roxy's bathtub, which would have been really bad. It would, it would have been a drug, like a drug overdose and she drowned. Oh, oh, yeah. So she would not have been alive. I'm going to start connecting dots here. She would have, she not would <laughs> She would not have been alive for me to introduce Eric to her. And she later dated some of uh, uh, the singer, I think it was from the band uh, Heaven from Australia. Right. Who were friends of mine when I, I knew them in New York when they played Great Gildersleeves. Holy so, smokes. Like that. Yeah. And and so and, and they dressed like Road Warrior, like all tattered leather and everything. Like and I, I, saw that I, I saw that idea when I was in Wasp. And right. I said to Blackie, we should dress like Road Warrior. That movie just came out. He goes, no, no, no. We'll scare away the record labels. <laughs> of course, what did they look like in that first show? Road oh Warrior. God. Thank you. Right, exactly. The black said, Blackie does it. Everything Blackie from the never, name to the makeup. <laughs> Blackie never throws away a good idea. No, of course not. So Bambi eventually becomes the model on the cover of the, al of the Poison album, Open Up and Say Ah. Oh, okay. The red girl with the like this and with the, yeah, the long yeah. tongue, yeah. that was Bambi. Oh, all right. Her, her real name is Virginia, Virginia Haas, and she's still she's still alive. Uh, that yeah, she she settled down and all that, but uh, she was part of the the scene with the girls, as I was saying back you know, back then. And so uh, that ties all of that together. So uh, so anyway, so that's that was that brings us so, up to so Steeler. right around 1983 when you met Steeler, correct? Right, they, they had, they were the hot up and coming band, the hot contenders, up against Rat and and Black and Blue and 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 you know, all the all the, the, the hot club drawing bands. Steeler you want to hear? So you want to hear a little coincidence? Ron Keel, you know, my vocal coach is the same coach as Ron Keel's. You don't and say. That was Elizabeth Sabine. Do you remember her? Elizabeth Sabine. That's right. That's Elizabeth right. Sabine was my vocal coach at the same time Ron, because she used to brag about Ron all the time. Right. Ron, Ron brought me once, one time. Yeah. Ron brought me with him to one of her, the, the lessons. She was amazing. amazing. And she, she, she tried me out. She said, you know, with the piano. Da, 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 You know, what can you hit? Well, she was she a vocal goes, strengthening. Goes, yeah. She says, you, you have the makings of a powerful, you're, 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 you're a more, more baritone. <clears throat> you can, you can hit some tenor stuff. Right. She goes, we, we should develop that. And then Ron never brought me back there again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to mention that because that's one coincidence that I had with Ron. I never really hung out with Ron, so I didn't know him too well. Yeah, but there's there's another dot we just connected. Yeah, it's amazing. Small world, especially in LA. Yeah. Uh, as Stephen Wright would say, it's a small world, but I'd hate to have to paint it. <laughs> so out of Warlord and Hellion, and then you joined Ron Keel. I, I jammed with Hellion a couple of times. We got okay. along really great, but okay. you know, nothing, nothing, there was nothing clicked at the time. Right. Well, but but uh, um, as I said, we we when we saw Steeler, I looked up but like Ron and Ron was hitting notes that would break glass. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, Elizabeth and, and Sabine and I, and I said, would always this, always brag about him being able to hit those high notes and stuff. Yeah. You they, were, they, were, they were they were a self contained unit. Right. Uh, the guitar <laughs> player's father owned everything. The truck, the lights, the PA, everything. He was he was the colonel. He owned everything. Now you spent and, what five? You spent about five months in Steeler, didn't you? Uh, they, something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, thereabouts. Uh, they had just done a, a showcase for every major label in town, and they all got they all, every label turned them down. Wow, wow. That's the reason why Ron sacked the whole lineup. Wow, I, and, I wanted to start over. Mm. He says, I needed to build a band that looked like they were already rock stars. I can't compete against what I, what's out there with, with the guys that I have. Right. And, and make no mistake, he had good players. But they didn't have the it factor. 
Right, right. And people had talked about me and said, there's this guy with the hair, this Rick Fox guy. Uh, I don't know what he, I don't know how he plays, but he's got a look. So check him out. That's how Ron said I got referred to him. So he contacted me from my, he goes, you had a professional looking ad at Red Right. And, and Ron, Ron had a business mind even back then. You know, he's, he knew what he was looking for. And, and he, so anyway, I might say that's what they call the Steeler Mansion. The Steeler it, Mansion? It was, yeah, it was called a mansion because it was it anything like a, but a mansion. Sounds like a Playboy Mansion. No, it was essentially three gutted storefronts overrun with roaches. Oh, my God. That's why they call it the mansion, because it wasn't a mansion. It was as Spartan as you could get. <laughs> the only thing holding up the only thing holding up the ceiling were the main supports. <laughs> kind of some Mad Max shit. Yeah. So and, and Ron was sleeping on a mattress on some on some milk crates. Uh the new drummer, Mark, was sitting on a match laying on a mattress on milk crates. Uh the kitchen was overrun with roaches. There was a giant water bed in there that the bass player left behind. It was like wow. a storage room. And, on, and there was a main common room, and then there was the rehearsal room, and then off to the side of the rehearsal was another smaller room. That wow. became my room, uh, like that. But uh, so I sat down, Ron and I talked, and he said, uh, "Here's the tape." It was like five or six songs. He goes, "Learn your songs, no promises. Uh, come back, and then we'll see what happens." I said, "All right, cool." So I learned the songs. Went back there and just Ron and I. There was no no gear. I walked in. There was no amps, no lights, no nothing. Just a, was there anybody else playing with Ron at the time? No, the okay. whole band was the whole band was gone. Gotcha. Okay. And was this and, before and, he met uh, Ingve Malmsteen, or was it? Uh, well, that comes later. That comes uh, after uh, me. Ah, uh, okay. So it's Ron sitting on a drum riser with his flying V, and I think he had a he had a rented amp from SIR. And, and and I walked in. I had a little little pig nose, or I had a lamp, oh, yeah. and we started playing. We played the Steeler songs, just Ron and Ron and me, one on one. And he says, uh, "Okay, you, you got the basics down out of that. Let's let's work on that." So we worked on that, and in our conversations, Kiss came out naturally. You know, my 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 being around early Kiss, and Ron was a huge Kiss fan. Right. And I said, being around Kiss. And and uh, uh, the guy who taught Kiss all of their stage moves and all of that, uh, who, who he was the unofficial fifth member of Kiss, was a guy named Sean Delaney. Okay, uh, uh, the people in the Kiss universe know who, who Sean is. He he was like the fifth member of Kiss. He worked with them on the on the flame, breathing the fire, the blood, all of the stage effects. Because uh, he was an off Broadway choreographer, he was right. a songwriter. So I worked with with one of, one of uh, Sean had other side project bands besides Kiss. So I worked with Sean and his bands. So I learned all of the choreography and all of that, that you know, the show business stuff. Right. So I said to Ron, to Ron, you know, I can show you all this stuff. And, you know, he said, yeah, that'd be great. So he says, uh, our new drummer's coming back from Texas. He's, at, he's visiting his family. So I get a car. We go to John Wayne Airport in Orange County. I pick up Mark Edwards. Could bring him back. He gets his drums out of storage. He sets them up, and and he was kind of a little distant, you know, at first. His Mark's a quiet, low key guy, right? And and he's, uh, I think he was a student of Tommy Aldridge. Okay. Yeah, he, got, he kind of looked a little like him with the curly hair. He played like him. Oh yeah. But that Mark was a no nonsense, meat and potatoes, but flashy drummer. So now we're rehearsing three piece, and and I. I Obviously, passed muster with 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 Mark as well as Ron. Right. So now now Steeler is rehearsing three piece, like Kiss without Ace Frehley. Right. And so we got to a point. Now we're this is like around I want to say uh, September, October, November of eighty three, eighty two. I'm sorry, eighty two. Uh, by my birthday, December twenty eighth. We were at the Rainbow, uh, and, and Ron sitting next to me. Ron goes, congratulations, man. You're the new bass player in Steeler. Let's make it official. So that was my birthday present for December 28, 1982, was Ron telling me, you're the new bass player in Steeler. Nice. So it was right after that, or around that time, Ron was on the phone with Varney, Mike Varney, 
that he had already been talking to Mike that we need a guitar player. Mm -hmm. You know, the band's coming together. So, so we got on a, a, a three-way phone conference with with Varney, us, and Malmstein. You know, and we we'd already heard Malmstein's demo, right? And there was nobody around to compare it to except maybe Eddie Van Halen, <laughs> you know, or maybe George Lynch, right? So, so uh, they made arrangements. Uh, runs uh, then girlfriend became wife at that point in his life. Uh, Dee Dee Keel. Who was a yeah. booking agent at the Roxy and and the whiskey? Right. Yeah, uh, they they went through the State Department. We flew him out from Sweden. He was all gung ho. Let's yeah, let's make this work. And uh, he walks into the Steeler Mansion and sees the what the conditions we were living in. <laughs> it was like total <laughs> culture shock. He's like, oh my, there's paint peeling off the ceilings, there's roaches, is it? You know. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, we get some rental amps for him to play through. Right. And we start working on the songs. At one point, it, we, we, we stop between songs. And Ingrid goes, hey, man, is, uh, is there anything you can do about these songs to make them a little more interesting? Because they're really quite fucking boring. Wow. And and wow is, is an understatement. <laughs> I'm standing. I'm standing right across from Malmstein when he said that. <laughs> Ron's standing here to my right. Mark's up here on the drum riser. <laughs> and I looked up at Mark. Mark just kind of like looked up at the ceiling, like 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 with the oh shit here it comes, you know, kind of kind of uh, 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 expression. And uh, hey, you know, a second. Hang on a second before I lose you. I gotta I gotta get the phone charger. Hold on. Go ahead. <laughs> I just looked up and saw that my phone was on 5%. And I'm wondering, why is the screen going dark? Oh, my God. I got, oh, everything. I got, I got everything on charge. I don't trust. Uh... Yeah. Okay. So now the phone's going to sit funny because the charge is at the bottom. There we are. <clears throat> so, so anyway, so I look at Mark, and he's, like, looking at the ceiling. He's got that, oh, shit. Did we just hear what we we heard? This, the, what we heard? The, the new guy just insulted Ron's song. <laughs> right. Malmsteen. And and Ron, the way I can describe it, if you know what a slow burn is, <laughs> you know when your face turns red, you're not yeah. saying anything, <laughs> yeah, right, and you're about to explode. That's the best way I can describe the expression on Ron's face. Oh, was 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 the slow burn, <laughs> and you could tell Ron was like he was processing what he just heard, and was trying to hold it in. Starting to understand why Malmstein became solo. Yeah, well, uh, so Ron goes, okay, all right. Uh, uh, the next day, he we already he was already we're already auditioning new guitar players. That's funny. So uh, I, I've heard some stories. I've heard some yeah, stories. And, and 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 they weren't they weren't these guys were not hitting the mark, man. They were nowhere near what Malmstein could do. Uh, so a phenomenal talent, but hard to work with. Yeah. And meanwhile, meanwhile, Ingve's living with us. He's staying at, at at with us, and you could obviously hear these guys through the walls. Uh, uh, you know, and they weren't. We, 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 I think we auditioned about four or five guys, and and none of them were hitting the mark. Yeah, yeah, kind of so, hard to compare to so, Ingve. Yeah, so Momstein finally goes. You know, all right, look, I'll, I'll play the game. Let's 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 just do this. And we settled down to and, and got serious. And so uh, uh, we got so tight, you couldn't slip a piece of paper in between us. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I like to say that we're, we're, we were so in, in the pocket, you wouldn't even know your change was gone. <laughs> nice, nice analogy. Sealer was, Sealer was ready to fucking rock. And right on the heels, because I, I, I was officially in, of December of 82. Momstein got there almost a year to the day after me. It was the first week of February that we flew him out and we picked him up at LAX. So uh, next thing you know, there's a gig, March 11th. And, and you know, this is like, we got so down to the grindstone, like, like uh, February, 
you know, Mark, Mark and I just to bass and drums, we would rehearse just bass and drums for like a couple hours. Right. And then we'd take a break. We'd have some ramen because we were all starving. Uh, the, the road crew stayed behind. We did have, we still, Ron maintained the road crew who lived there as well. Uh, they were, they stayed in a different part of the, of the, of the, uh, the, the building like that. And, and so, uh, so we learned all these creative ways of how to eat top ramen. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm telling you, it was, it was Spartan living. Well, uh, so going back to what you guys started selling out clubs with Steeler. Well, we, we got, we got, and then, and yeah, we got some really great gigs. The first, the first gig we did was March 11th, uh, uh, which is why I said February was a tough month. It was a lot of rehearsal. Our first debut with the new lineup, what what we became called is the, the classic album lineup. Okay, uh, was March 11th mm -hmm. at the at the Country Club in Reseda, and we opened for Hughes Thrall, which was was uh, uh, Glenn Hughes from Deep Purple, right, and, right, right. and Pat, Pat Thrall. Who, who played with Pat Travers. And Vandenberg, it looks like. Yeah. Well, no, well, Vandenberg was after that. That was after that. Yeah, through through Dee Dee through Keel and, and her gracious uh, help, we were able to nail some really quality choice gigs. Like and that, that led to opening up for Quiet Riot, correct? Yeah, yeah. Actually, the, the original opening act for the for Quiet Riot was a band out of Illinois it's called the Bees. B Z Z Z Z, which which were which were originally called the Boys B O Y Z Z Z Z. I remember those guys. Yeah, and and so I and they played Gildersleeves in New York, so I I was friends with those guys too. Uh, but I the original news, the original mm -hmm. newspaper ad said Quiet Riot mm -hmm. with the Bees. Right. Next thing I know, Steelers got the gig. Nice. So, so so we uh. We we uh, we opened for Hughes Thrall, and the entire L L A was there, and, and again it was the same expression like the French Knights in Monty Python and Holy Grail. <laughs> Mom's team, you know, it was like like oh my, it was like how do you describe seeing Mom's team for the first time? You know what I'm saying? Uh, un unleashed on L A. Right. And as as me jumping around in my my black leather outfit, you know, with the hair and all that, <laughs> and all. Where did these guys come from? You know, did you, like, did you do oh, any are... did you do any vi music videos with uh, Steeler at all? No, no. I, sadly, we did not. Oh, that's too bad. We don't have anything on video, which is a shame. Um, we so did hoping that. to play something maybe during this podcast. We'd like to about halfway yeah. through. There is some video, but it's not our lineup. It's it's okay. a different lineup with Steeler. Gotcha. Uh, um, so then we, we we got the gig at the Roxy. We did uh, a double night with uh, Vandenberg. Oh, yeah. It was an early show, and it was a late show. <clears throat> so we did that, and that was packed. Uh, uh, we, we played the Troubadour, and I don't have any pictures or, or or newspaper ads from the Troub. I don't know why. Because the, we did the Country Club again with Black and Blue. And I remember Black and Blue, yeah. Yeah, and, and when we, we played the Troubadour the week after, the line was out the club around up to Doheny and around a corner. Uh, so we were selling out everywhere. And then we got the gig with Quiet Riot in May. And that's right when Metal Health went number one and knocked Michael Jackson out of number one in Billboard. Did it really? Wow. Yeah. Mental and Health, so, yeah, that was one of the biggest albums. And we played, we played Perkins Palace. Which is in Pasadena. It's, it's a yeah. la landmark location. Yeah, I played there. That, that that's where Spinal Tap filled a lot of their concert scenes. <laughs> you know, the, the scene when they're talking about you know, the album being black. Right. That 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 scene with the, where uh, the girlfriend's there, and you can see all the seats in the theater, and then the, the manager <laughs> shows up with the box albums. That's, oh, that's Perkins. Perkins. Pal <laughs> that's Perkins Palace. Yeah. I forgot that. Yeah. Yeah. So so uh, you, just to give you an idea of what the what this this the the. the the, the facility. Well, well like. let's get to Steeler. They changed the lineup. Let's get to the end of Steeler. They changed the lineup yeah. a few times. And you were kind of at the tail end of, it sounds like, Steeler. And uh, Steeler changed their lineup and then called the band Ron Keel or, or Keel eventually, right? Uh, yeah, they changed the lineup a couple of times. What happened was uh, um, after our last show in May of 83, uh, Momstein had Momstein had already been making connections to get out of the band. He was looking for another gig. 
Okay. So he had already connected with uh, Alcatraz. Oh, yeah. And the day after our last show together, we were supposed to have a band meeting. It was just, just me and Mark. Ron wasn't there. Ingve wasn't there. Mark tells me ingve has gone. He's already joined Alcatraz. Uh, their manager's coming to pick him up and whatever his gear is. Uh, and he says, we're, we're, Ron says, we're, we're reforming the band. Uh, you know, it's just me and, me and Ron. So we're going to get new guys. I said, well, you mean I'm out? He says, yeah, we're going to get another bass player. I said, what did I do? He goes, <laughs> he goes, you didn't do anything. We just want to get somebody else. Wow. Said, so that That's was story. my story. That story follows you around. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, and, and again, I had replaced the bass player in yeah. his steel. <laughs> the replacements. So, yeah. So Steeler got another lineup of Ron Ron Murray on bass and Mitch Perry on guitar, right? And then uh, uh, then they had another lineup with Kurt James and Bobby Marks on drums and Greg Chase on on bass. Okay, Chase on, yeah, right. And it was after that lineup, it, it just fell. You know, it, I think Ron, as Ron tells the story, he already hooked up with with the guys in Black Sabbath. Gotcha, gotcha. And he was. It looked like he was going to sing for Black Sabbath. He did a project with them, Emerald something, and then then Sabbath found you know uh, either Tony Martin or Ray Gillen or so. so at that yeah, point, yeah. Ron, that's when Ron says he decided to form Keel and just change it to Keel. Now you were on the albums uh, Metal Generation, The Steeler, and Anthology. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, he just released one called Hell or Come Hell or Hollywood. But you're that's still on. You're on those albums. That's the original lineup is on Come Hell or Hollywood. Gotcha. I'm on the I'm on the anthology and the other thing. Like okay, that. got it, got it. Got it. Yeah. And and like that, and we and we couldn't use any pictures of Momstein because he sued. You, you wouldn't, we weren't allowed to use his image. Really? Well, that's yeah. interesting. Now, yeah, do you but, still have yeah. the YouTube bootleg a Steeler performance recorded? Do you still have that? I don't. I don't have it, but I've seen it. That's at that's at the Roxy, I think. You, and you're on the live. And you're on that version, the video. No. I was You're already gone on. by then. Okay, okay. Yeah. I got you. There, there are recordings of us uh, off the board, live. Like bootleg, from, uh, like some bootleg stuff? Yeah, some bootlegs from uh, the country club. Okay. And then we recorded the Perkins Palace show on Ingve's boombox on the soundboard. <laughs> and somehow <laughs> that tape, box. That tape, yeah, he had a boombox. That <laughs> tape wound up in Japan. And somebody pressed a bootleg live album of Steeler. Off that? Called, it's Off called Excited. Wow. It's called Excited eighty three. No kidding. And it's our Perkins Palace show, and it's also a, a live Ingve Malmsteen uh, uh, album in there from when he opened up for ACDC on ACDC's tour. Wow. So that's pretty much it. That's how Steeler wound up ending, and Ron went on and formed Keel. Did you ever come back and get involved at all with Keelfest when he did all that? Yeah. Uh, uh, after Tar and I married and we moved up to a, uh, we bought a horse ranch up in uh, Santa Clarita. Okay. And Ron called me up around 2000, I want to say maybe 16 or 17. And he says, uh, I want to do some stuff with Steeler. Are you in? I said, yeah, I'll, I'm in, definitely. And uh, he said, I'm putting this thing together. Keep it under your hat. And when all right. Uh, yeah. Keep it, keep it under my hat. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Where's that hat? I had a hat. I got a I got he, a... Put, he, he put together this thing called Keel Fest, which would be the Ron Keel band as the headliners, uh, Keel and Steeler. Nice hat. So, uh, and the first, it was the first Steeler reunion. Right. And it was the re it was the reunion that all the critics said would never happen. I've been told for years how many people said, "Forget Steeler, it's a, it's an old dream, it's never going to happen again." Rick, move on. Rick, move on. Move Forget on. about Steeler's <laughs> fucking. Old. It's old news. Story of your life. Move on. Yeah, I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, and here comes what the first Steeler reunion. Oh my gosh. So and it was our guitarist named Mitch Perry. Who's that? I'm, I'm just uh, kind of looking at my notes. Mitch Mitch has played with everybody you probably know. Uh uh Edge of Winter, Cher, oh, wow. uh um uh Michael Shanker, I think he played with Shanker. Wow. Uh, uh, okay. Alice. Mitch, Mitch is one of those guys. He's real quiet, 
but he's one of those session guys that is played with everybody who's huge. Like that. That's kind of like and, you a little bit. You've played with almost you know, everybody. I'm not as quiet. I'm not. I'm not. No, I'm not as quiet as Mitch. I'll tell you that. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I got a mouth on me. That's okay. Makes for anyway, a good story. So, so anyway, uh, um, so so uh, Ron puts this lineup together. He goes, "I got Mitch Perry on guitar. I got Dwayne Miller on drums from Keel." I says, "Okay." And and he, he sets up a rehearsal in, in uh, North Hollywood. We walk in the room, and Keel had just finished rehearsing. I right, well, we walk in the room. We all look at each other. I went, well, hi boys. Let's get this. Let's see what happens. And and after the first song, Ron turns around, looks at me, and goes, "All right, boys, well, I'm going to see you in Ohio." Wow. Uh, uh, and and we went through the Steelers set, and 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 Ron recorded some of it. And uh, he said, "Rick, he goes. He goes. Your bass playing's come a long way." He goes, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed. I'm like, thank you, Ron. It's that should be appreciated. <laughs> and uh, our first show was in Columbus, Ohio. I think it was May of 2019. Okay. And and we played at Al, the Al Rosa Villa, which was one of the main clubs on the touring circuit in the Midwest. Oh, okay. And it's known because it was the club that Dimebag got shot in. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So I, I saw the bullet holes in the wall in the dressing room. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah. So we did that. And there's some video of it on, up on YouTube. Uh, Ron <laughs> also did a, did a tribute yeah. to, Black, to Black Sabbath and Ronnie James Dio. And there's a, there's a couple of renditions up there on, on YouTube <clears> of us doing Heaven, Heaven and Hell. I'd like to see that. I'd like to also move forward with your solo career with Sin. There's a big story there. You've done a lot with Ron Keel. Um, God bless him. But you moved on to a solo album or a solo project with Sin. Tell me how that went down. After Steeler, uh, I didn't want to lose any momentum. Right. And I still didn't have a proper way to screen people. You know, like that. It was just all word of mouth, word of mouth, word of mouth. And people would see me at the clubs and, you know, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? What's up? I got introduced to his keyboard player. He looked a little bit like Greg Jafria. Same haircut. Oh, yeah. I remember him. God, I had set up, heard that he had name. Set up, yeah. He was like a cross between John Lord from Deep yeah. Purple and Greg, yeah, yeah. And Greg Jafria. Wow. That, was Vince, that was Vince Gilbert. Okay. And I said, well, I'd, I'd like to put something together. And we again, we, uh -huh. we had the commonality of bands like Deep Purple and Uriah Heep and Angel. And he goes, he goes, yeah, that's right at my wheelhouse. I can do that. I said, so let's put something together like a cross between Angel and Judas Priest. How about like a real heavy version? <laughs> so, so, uh, and so we, we started to put that together. That'd be the glam and, and the studs and the leather. The glam and the leather all yeah. came together. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, I got the drummer from Greg Leon's band called James Elizondo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I don't remember how we got the singer, Art. He was just a referral. And, and the guitar player, Howard Jarrosson, was a referral from a friend of him. And, and I was getting hit up by all these guys who wanted to play with me because they were Malmsteen fans. And I'm like, I don't want to go in that direction. I want to go back to the 70s. Right. You know, <laughs> let, let, got guitar players like Leslie West, you know, and Mick Box, and Uriah Heat, that kind of stuff. And what did we get? We got a guitar player to play like Randy Rhodes and Ingrid Malmsteen. <laughs> So, uh, uh, and that was one of the, that's where the song On the Run came from. Uh, uh, we were in rehearsal one day and, and Howard starts noodling around while he's warming up and he's just playing this repetitive pattern. I had my recorder with me. I said, give me a couple of passes of that, that what you're playing. And that's all it was, was, you know, him going. And I took that home with my, with my bass. And I wrote on the run. I was I was in a situation. I was in, in a, in a, a angry frame of mind when I wrote the lyrics, like that. And and that's where the song on the run came from. Oh, okay. And uh, that was became one of the, you know, the big mainstays of our set, like that. We recorded a, a, a collector's now a collector's edition picture disc with the snake with the sin logo. And it's uh, it's got uh, captured in time on the other side, which sounds like a cross between Raya Heap and Rainbow. But we just we just we just let loose on that. Not a bad combo. I love yeah, Rainbow. yeah, yeah. Thank you. And then you know, within I mean, we were headlining right out the gate because I had I had the uh, 
the box office reputation from Steeler, you know, and, and I called up the Troubadour. I said, we'd like to do a show at your club. And they said, well, you can start on Wednesday or Tuesday at eight o'clock. I'm like, wait a minute. I just, I just headlined your club. And they said, well, who are you? <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm Rick Fox. I was the bass player in Steeler. And the booking agent goes, oh, all right, Saturday night, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Who do you want to have open? Who do you want to have closed? Nice. Like, wow, that's that was a that was a very nice perk. Yeah. So yeah, and and, and so we picked the, the best bands we were friends with. And, know, and that was that was with Sin, correct? That was with that Sin. was with Sin. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and so that's what we were doing for about six months. And, and and at first, the guys in the band didn't want to use the name Sin. He said that was the band name your band in Jersey. We need a new name. I said I I said I agree. Okay, let's uh, uh, two weeks or or a week. If you guys can't come up with a new name, then it's, we're going to use Sin. You know, I'm going to call that shot here. I'm going to draw that line in the sand. Uh, uh, you know, because I I had the bigger draw of anybody else in the band. Well, would you, you know, say they, Sin Sin opened up some doors for you as well? Yeah, Be, yeah absolutely. That yeah, yeah. And that, that's what we were for six months. We were headlining everywhere, uh, almost everywhere. Uh, we did some big shows at Perkins Palace with Malice and Armor. We 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 closed for Armored Saint. You know, I used to and rehearse it, right next door to Armored Saint. They, they were yeah, that was my neighbor. Yep. yep and then so uh, uh, we went in the studio to record what would be our first album. Uh, they brought a new manager in who I didn't know. I couldn't I couldn't find out enough about her background. And she wanted me to sign all these contracts. I said, all right, let me take them to an attorney and I look them over. And I'm like, what do you mean an attorney? Don't you trust us? So I became Rick Fox, the problem. Rick Fox, <laughs> the boat, rock, the boat rocker, the, the loose cannon. Yeah, because I, I wouldn't sign a contract. Because I wanted to have it looked at first by an attorney. Well, why not? Yeah. That's where the thing about Rick Fox becoming a, becoming difficult so it was originated from. You remind me of myself a little bit in that respect. Yeah. I didn't sign any contracts. So we, we go into the studio. Uh, Bill Matoyer from Metal Blade is engineering. And it turned into a spinal tap moment. All of the arguments, all of the bickering, all of the all of the disagreements came to a head like a boil and it purrs, burst and the, the pus went everywhere. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I said, that's it. I've had it up to here. I'm, 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 that's it. <laughs> well, good luck. I packed up my base. I walked out <laughs> said, I said, I apologize to Bill Matoyer. He he heard what he heard all the yelling and that, what was going on. Oh, wow. I said, I, I apologize for this, uh, but I, I, I cannot tolerate it anymore. And I walked out. Wow. They tried to continue on with the name Sin, but I had already – that was another thing that pissed them off. Is I already had, had uh, trademarked, service marked the name. Right, so that was your so band. That was your name. Sin and the logo and the description belonged to me. I owned it. And they kept trying to book themselves as Sin and started trying to add periods like Wasp. Like Blackie added the periods in Wasp after I was out of the band. You know, he thought so, I was so, so, so by now back to Wasp, uh, when they did that and they the acronym was White Anglo Saxon Protestant, how, now, who, who came up with that? Is or is that just something people made up? That's it's made up. There was there was no no, it, um, Chris Holmes told me that Blackie did that because he thought I was going to sue the band, so he added periods which would add some kind of mystique to the band, so you uh, can kind of figure out on your own what you think it means. Gotcha, gotcha. And eventually, what what actually came out to me was we're all side players. <laughs> if you look, so at, that was actually out, that was actually something they just grabbed out of the four initials. They just made that up, or was that something? Yeah. Well, people would people would ask Blackie, "What does that stand for?" And he'd say, "We ain't sure, pal. We ain't sure, pal." <laughs> and he can't. He's not going to tell you the truth because he's not going to credit me with the guy who came up with the name he won't do that he's been he's he's fought that story for decades till this okay, day well so real quick sin got a major record label Does, did you get any attention from sin in, on the record industry did you get signed well, it, it, it wasn't a major label it was it was one of the minor labels okay but after i left there was the big battle in public over the name for sin okay gotcha so they were trying to they were trying to book themselves as sin and i would go to all of the booking agencies i'd go to all the news uh the la la weekly the, all the club whoever was putting up the ads for the for the shows i'd say look here's my proof i'd send them copies i own the name so now everybody in la is caught in the middle of this battle what do we call them okay you know but that's that's where rick fox's sin came from 
Okay. All right. Let's, so, let's, okay. Real quick. Let's let's move on to burn and surgical steel. You had a new new life began for Rick okay. Fox. Okay. Let's let's move forward to the the stuff where your your career really started to light on fire. Everybody started to know who Rick Fox was yeah. in the public. So tell me a little bit yeah. more about that. Okay. The second lineup of sin became headliners. We played everywhere. Huge, huge. I mean, just just. I, I I had the guys from from a New York band called Alien came out and joined me. So now we sounded like Priest. Priest okay. Iron Maiden. Okay. All right. We were, we were a headline in the clubs. And then after we got in the studio, uh, a management came in. Dana Strum came in, produced us, uh, stole my song on the run, gave it to Vinnie Vincent, called it Let Freedom Rock, and the band broke up. No, no. I was trying to really encapsulate this. Sin, so at that point, Sin folded. Um, so and Sin was no longer. Sin was no longer. Okay. There were con there were concessions that I I was not I was not able to to concede to that they wanted to do with the band after all the work I, I brought to the table with it. Gotcha. So I happened to be out at at Mate's rehearsal studio one day with some friends and Burn, who Dana Strum also produced. Burn okay. was what they think bass players. And so, uh, and I had I had written. Meanwhile, I'd written. I was writing press releases and and bio bi band bios for bands for the from the girl I was dating. She was doing press for bands and stuff. All right. So she, she said, you know, help me write something for Burn, which I did. And then, uh, and so because we were from the same stable, so more or less, uh, uh, the guys in Burn asked me if I wanted to audition. I said, guys, I was in Steeler. You know what I could do? They said, yeah, I know. It's just a formality. I went, all right. So they, I, 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 uh, they gave me the demo. I learned the songs. I went back to Mates. I auditioned for Burn. Uh, long story short, I got the gig. Now I'm in Burn. Burn is managed by Niji, which is Ronnie Dio's management. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Wendy Dio's managing Rough Cut. Uh, Kurt Lorraine, out of out of underneath uh, Wendy, was managing us in in, in uh, Burn. And we're there, we we lost our singer. We're in in, a, in an interim looking for singers. In the meantime, I was friends with the road manager for uh, Loudness. Oh yeah, I remember Loudness. Yeah. And Loudness had just released the, the Lightning Strikes album. This was uh, 85, 86. And so he says, to, I, I I bumped it over. <clears> so <throat> he, he says, Hey, I, I, Loudness is coming to the West Coast. We got Poison and Cinderella flip flop on the openings. You want you want to come hang out with us on the road? I said sure. So he gives me he gives me a pair of you know all access loudness laminates. Right. <laughs> so I hung out with them. I saw them in a couple of shows in L.A. And then I went out to Phoenix. So I went out to, to Phoenix and I hung out with them there. And that's why I was introduced to Jim Keeler. And uh, it was like a five minute thing. You know, oh, you played with Steeler. Yeah, hi, hi, Bobby. Oh, you're I'm, I'm in Surgical Steel. Okay. And that was that. Uh, after that, I came back to L.A. I walk in the door. My phone's ringing. And and this guy who I, who I met there in Phoenix, he's a, he was like a small-time promoter. He's yelling on the phone, you got to come back. you got to come back. Jimmy wants you to come. you got to play with Surgical Steel. <clears throat> I said, I don't, I don't even know anything about the band. You know? I, I, and he says, well, well they're going to fly you out. I said, all right, well, give me a minute. Give me a minute. <laughs> and and I, I started making phone calls. I, I said, who's Surgical Steel? They said, oh, if you like Judas Priest, you'll like Surgical Steel. And and they were in that movie, uh, Thunder Alley. And, and you know, Jeff Martin was singing for them at the time. He was like like, like Rob Halford. I went, oh, okay. Well, I'll, 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 all right. I got to say, they, you had some great singers on, on the albums you've been on. Some great yeah. albums. Yeah. Yeah. So here's me. Here's me. What happened was Jim Keeler, who was the band leader of, of, of Surgical Steel, did the exact same thing Ron Keel did with Steeler. He sacked the whole lineup. And yeah. it was reform, reform the band with all so new right. guys. Mm -hmm. Here's me replacing another bass player. Wow. And uh, and so um, I get to the, I, I get to Phoenix. I get to Jimmy Keeler's house. I said, so when do I audition? He goes, Chief, you're not going to audition. You're in the band. He goes, we're doing an album next week. Here's the <laughs> song. Learn them. Hit the ground running. And I'm telling you, the rubber the rubber was already spinning before it hit mm -hmm. the road. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. He was already building a drum riser out of aircraft aluminum, a, a four-level drum riser, uh, and all that. 
and and so uh so i started learning the songs we had we had trouble finding the right drummer but we got we got to randy randy marchetti out of phoenix incredible drummer mm -hmm. uh derek kendall on vocals and we went to the studio and we start recording an album with dan wexler from icon producing okay and then all of a sudden in the middle of it oh uh, uh we had uh, um George George Lynch was living in Phoenix at the time, and Mick Brown was staying at his house. Right. So George Lynch and Mick Brown come to the studio, and and we got Mick Brown to, to play on one of the. I, I, uh, there's a song we did in Sin, uh, that that uh, they fairly wound up doing too. It's called "We Got Your Rock," and 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 there's another dot connect story to that, but I don't want to depart from that right now. So we're we're doing "We Got Your Rock," and we brought Mick Brown in, and we did a couple of passes, and he heard it, so. Mick Brown and I recorded the Bay the Rhythm track, so we got your rock. It came off killer. And then the next thing you know, uh the album's the album stalled. The the, you know, the making of the album. Uh their financial backing stopped. Oh my gosh. Got cut off. So right. now there's an there's an unfinished surgical steel album floating around out there. Is that can and you still get a copy of Surgical Steel? Can anybody get it? It never they, got released. Never got released. Okay. They're, they're trying to find out what happened to the tapes. I got you. Wow. Okay. A lot of lot of back end information, you know, that yeah. go on, yeah. pretty, pretty much go on forever. <laughs> I'm in I'm in I'm in touch with Derek. He doesn't know where the tapes are. I'm in touch with Jimmy Keeler. They're still trying to find the, the tapes that so from, from that album. And so uh um uh, we started doing shows in, in Phoenix. Uh that's where I met Madam X. That's when I first met Sebastian Bach, right when he joined Madam X before before um uh, he before he joined uh, um uh uh um oh my god, I'm brain farting here. <laughs> uh, uh so he um anyway. Uh, so so we play in Phoenix and we got an uh, a gig supporting Lita Ford for New Year's Eve. Nice. I love Lita. I call up my 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 rep at Randall Amps and I says Bill Bill Acton, I said we're, we're playing with Lita Ford. Can you can you get us some backline? Mm. He says yeah. What do you need? I told you, he, 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 he got a local local guy uh, rep for for Randall. Jimmy Keeler was playing through I think seven Randall's triple stacks, three cabinets high. God, I haven't heard that in a while. I think with, with, two, yeah. with the heads on top, he got me like nine nine base cabinets, reflex cabinets. We were our, our stuff went up to the ceiling. I, I don't know if I sent you a picture of it. Does Randall uh, make guitar amps or just bass amps? They make now amps. it's just guitar. They don't do bass amps. They haven't okay. done bass amps for decades. Okay, because uh, I remember they, Randall, but I haven't seen much of Randall lately. I haven't seen yeah, it. They, the company's been bought and sold so many times that they yeah. stopped making. I, I got one of the last bass amps. Gotcha. So we're doing a sound check. Lita Ford comes walking in behind me. I could see the shadow over on the floor. And I turn around, I look at Lita Ford. She's standing there. Her jaw is on the ground. <laughs> she's, looking, she's looking at the walls of amps. She's going, <laughs> man, we don't even have gear like this. She goes, you, you, we're, we're headliners. We don't have, she goes, we don't have anything like this. And she goes, Tequila, can we use your back line? <laughs> I said, oh, you want to negotiate? Okay. <laughs> you want to negotiate. Uh, we also had a tour bus. Didn't Lita Ford have her own backline at the time? Yeah, but not like that. Not like that. Okay. Yeah, she might have had like you know, a couple of stacks. In the base floor might have had a stack or two or some. You know, they didn't have anything like what we had. We, this was our hometown, you know, for, right. for, for Keeler. <laughs> Surgical Steel was the big fish in the little pond in, in Phoenix. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So, uh, so, um, uh, well, we also had a tour bus, and her manager says, "Well, can Lita use the tour bus instead of you know the regular dressing room?" <laughs> so you know now, and, and and so I'm hanging out on the tour bus with Lita while she's getting ready for the show. She nice. likes us. She, she's like, "Your costumes was, was outrageous." Did Ray Brown make your costume? And I went, "No, I made it myself." Just like Rick Fox, I man, you're so talented. Rick, now, did you really time, make your own costumes? Because. Uh... Yeah, I, I designed my stuff. So if, if it was something I, I – I didn't have a sewing machine. I did everything by hand. Now, now, you were back in the Renaissance days. Did you make your own costumes for the Renaissance fairs and all that? Some of them, yes. I, I would start I would start with a with a um, uh, something to work off of, and I would I would do the, all the customization I, later on. I see on. that. Yeah, yeah. You're very talented. I, I, would, I, would, I would customize my stuff, yeah. Okay, okay. Like that. But, but uh, um, 
Because Lois and I is, make we make our own uh, outfits when we Lois and I go to the Renaissance fairs, and she oh, does okay. all she makes all our own outfits. Cool, yeah, cool, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, well, for Polish stuff, you couldn't find anything when I started. I was I was doing it myself. Gotcha. But but uh, with Lita, the thing was, when I was staying at Roxy's apartment, and she said, "Go next door. I need to ask Nikki something." And she was Nikki was running an electric tap out of his apartment into into Roxy's apartment because he had no power. Nikki who? Six. Nikki six. Okay, that's what I thought. All right. The whole band had moved out of the apartment on Clark Street, and and he had no electricity, and so he would run a, you know uh, uh, an extension out of Roxy's apartment through the back balcony uh, into Nikki's apartment. So I go knocks on the door. I can hear Nikki in there going, "Yeah." I said, it's Rick from next door. Roxy sent me in to ask you something. He goes, come on in, dude. <laughs> so, so I go to push the door open, and there's a chair against it. I push the door open. He's got two two love seats pushed together, and he jumps out of the love seats, and I'm talking to him, and I look, and I see the blanket move. He was sleeping in there. And I see the blonde hair coming out under the blanket, and then I see the blanket coming down. I see the face. I, 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 knew, the, I knew who it was by the hair. By the time the blanket came down to the eyes, I went, Lita? <laughs> so Nikki was dating Lita at the time, or sleeping with Lita at the time. Okay. And she goes, hey, dude. And she goes, you look familiar. I said, do you remember when the Runaways played CBGBs around 75, 76? She goes, yeah. I said, that's when we first met. I was there. She goes, dude, that's why you look familiar. <laughs> I said, you know, I I met I met the you know I talked those, to Lita and Jackie. Lita and those Jackie were good Fox. times. Those were good times. Right. So there's those dots connected. Oh my god, geez. Oh god. Lita goes, come on, let's go out for breakfast. She took me and Nikki out for breakfast. Nice. Okay. And 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 so that was the connection. So now I'm in surgical steel years later. We're we're supporting Lita. And I threw those stories back. She remembers. She goes, I remember every one of those. Yes, I do. <laughs> so you know, so, so we're yakking on the tour bus like that. And and she kicked everybody else off from surgical steel. <laughs> oh my god! And, and like so, that's that's kind of like my steel story. Uh, uh, eventually, you know, uh, it, it just kind of fell apart. So yeah. I, I left I left surgical steel, and I came back to LA. You know, and they continued on with it. Greg Chase on followed me in surgical steel. Now Chase on eventually became a member of Freak Show, didn't he? When Greg, Freak yeah, yeah well, he was. The way the way Greg told me was I wasn't a member. I recorded the album yeah. with them, yeah, yeah. and and they wanted me to join, but I couldn't. I, I had other commitments. I have my guitar store in Phoenix. He had okay. his own band at uh, Atomic Kings, and and he couldn't join the band. So, but but you know he's on the album. Greg Chasen's on the album. Well, you've done a lot. You've done a lot in the business, and you're in demand. But it's just it's it's ironic that you know you get in these great bands, and then all of a sudden you're moving yeah. on again. You know. Yeah, that well, seems to be so a stigma that's following me. <laughs> well, but you have so much okay. talent. You have so much talent. And now, going back to your discography real quick, I just want to run through. 1975, you had some releases, and uh, let's see, what was it? Uh, uh, live performances. Matt, we're going back to Kansas City again. But you've done so much stuff. With Sin, you had uh, The Aggressor. You did some stuff with Wasp and uh, Helion, Steeler. And then Steeler again. And we are, man, you've done a lot of stuff. Um, I did two songs on, on, on an album by a guy out of Buffalo called Jim Jim Crean. And I recorded two songs on his album, The, the London Fog. Okay. And I did the I did the uh the title cut Broken with uh Vinnie Apice. Oh yeah. Uh, on drums and and I did a song. We did a remake of an Angel song, which was uh, um, uh, Frank Domino and and uh, from Angel and and uh, um, Vinnie Apice played on that as well. So I, I did those two songs with those guys. Uh, I've I've rec I've performed live with Ronnie James Dio singing. Uh, oh, so twice. so back to Ronnie. What did you do with Ronnie? Did you did you play bass for him or? What happened? No, no. Uh, I was in Surgical Steel at the time. Okay. They had already released the MTV thing of the production of We're Stars. Okay. And uh, I was at, at – Dio was playing at, at Irvine Meadows in Orange County, California. It was the Sacred Heart Tour. Okay. I was standing backstage talking to somebody, and Wendy Dio comes up, grabs me by my elbow, 
drag. She goes, come on, come on, come on. And they were grabbing anybody from Hollywood who was in a band. And they would, we would go, we went underneath the scaffolding around the back. We all came out on stage. And and uh, we we joined Ronnie in the in the first live rendition of We're Stars. Oh, okay. So, so the guys from Poison, uh, 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 Nader from London. It was a whole bunch of us out there singing, you know, the live version of We're Stars. Right. The next weekend, Rough Cut was playing at the Country Club. I remember Rough Cut. A bunch yeah. of us were hanging out up on the on the VIP balcony. Same thing. Wendy grabs us and says, "Come on, let's go down to the stage." So we go down to the stage. We all, you know, uh, 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 gather around Ronnie, and we did a, a live rendition again. This uh, we repeated of "We're Stars," and I'm standing like right next to Ronnie, and uh, he looks up at me, he sticks his mic in from my face, and he goes, "Sing!" <laughs> and that's that's that picture that you have of me of me and Ronnie together. Oh, okay, uh, all right. That's that was that moment where we now, we were he's, together. He's a short. He's a short guy. You're six foot tall. What is he, Ronnie? Like five five. Five, four. Uh, well, I I did look down to him like that, and, <laughs> and he was on my he was I think on my my right. Uh, you, you've um, done so much. You've done so much. Now I know you have other interests. You have a life outside of rock and roll. Yeah. And I and I'm looking at the California State Military Reserve, and uh, I just I read I, I find it fascinating that you did all that, and it was a volunteer, right? Volunteer position. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that happened right after the Rodney King riots. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And I was living in Hollywood, and I could see the, the columns of smoke working their way up from South Central L.A. towards oh Hollywood. I, rem I remember like yesterday. And National Guard was in, stationed and posted in various spots around Hollywood. Right, 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 right. My, my come from a family of, of, of military and police background. right. Uh, my dad was in Korea, as I said earlier, in, 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 the, uh, in the Navy. Was that in the mid-50s, 50, uh, 54, 55, Korea yeah, War? Yeah, 52, 50, my, oh, 50, my, 50, 51, 52. Like my, that. my dad was in a submarine under the Korean uh, Harbor. Okay. And then my, my, uh, my uncle, my dad's brother, who I'm named after, uh, he, was in the, he was in the Marines in Korea. Okay. And then we had, you know, back in Brooklyn, we had various relatives scattered around who were in police, police department and stuff like that. So... Um, I thought maybe there's a way I could give back. Yeah. Nice. You know, and in, in California, we, when we used to have uh, the big conventions, the gun shows. <clears throat> right. At, these, at the gun expos. And there was a military section where the Marines had their armored vehicles on display. Uh, the California Military Vehicle Collectors Club had a display. And right. across from them, across from them was the California State Military Reserve. Oh, okay. Which is, which is a volunteer unit. It's the lowest branch of the Army. And I, 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 you know, they had a whole set up there display. So and Tara's with me at this moment. My, 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 it wasn't my wife yet. It was, it was still Tamara. Okay, so you're still dating. We, we, we were dating, yeah, and and going out with each other. And and so uh, I walk up to the to the uh, the top sergeant, uh, um, and I says, I heard a rumor that because you guys are essentially like a civilian volunteer thing, you're not allowed to infringe on people's personal lifestyles. He goes, that's true. I said I heard there's guys in the, your, your 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 service that they can wear like a, a, a conservative wig when they're on duty. Is that true? He says I heard something about that. Let me look into that. I said if you can do that for me, I'll join. <laughs> and within two days, he called me back. He says we can get you special dispensation. If your hair looks like like it's uh, uh, you know conservative while you're on duty. We can we can waive that for you. I said, gotcha. count me in, color me in. And they brought me in as a as a corporal E4. It was an electronics detachment unit. And, and we worked at the Office of Emergency Services at Los Alamitos, that yeah. at the, uh, the, the the military base there. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and and so I, I was brought in and uh the first guy in in the unit. To bring, get my TA-50, my basic kit put together out of pocket, uh, uniform and everything that goes with it, all your accessories and necessities, uh, everything I needed, helmet, uh, the whole the whole schmear, the whole nine yards, all all out of pocket. Because they don't right. they don't they don't pay they don't pay for anything. Now you don't you don't you swear in to the to the military articles of justice. 
Uh, you wear the uniform. You salute the flag. You do basic stuff. Uh, but at that time, we didn't uh, train with weapons. And you didn't get a DD-214. Okay. But you are considered a branch of the Army. You are the state reserve, not 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 the Army reserve. Is there another certification that says you did it? That would, would, you know. Yeah, yeah, I have all of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and and I, I joined in uh, 1995. I, I left in 2000. I put in five years. And uh, and and that was it. I, you know, we got some unit citations. <clears throat> uh, Schwarzenegger was the governor at the time. Oh well, yeah. Okay. There, there was a couple of uh, uh, state disasters, and when they put they put the National Guard in the front line for a disaster or emergency. That's right. where we we step in and fill the hole. We're the we're we're, we're the support. Kind of like what they're doing on the border right now out in Texas. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> and, and and so that's what we did. And and so uh, uh, that technically makes me a veteran. So you can but, go to the uh, uh like uh join like the American Legion or, or uh, one of those establishments. Um, yeah, yeah, I could do that. I could do that. You were, I, you were a member yeah. of the military. Yeah. Because I, I uh, one of my friends that I, I, I made friends with in the unit, uh, he was another sergeant. Uh, I, I called him one day. I said, I, I'm filling out a, a job application. He says, well, are you a veteran? Do you have status? And he says, did you wear the uniform? I said, yeah. He goes, did you salute to the flag? I said, yeah. He goes, did you swear to the code of military justice? I said, yeah. He goes, you're a veteran. <laughs> the only thing missing is the DD-214. I'm a son of a legion. I'm a son of my dad. So I'm also yeah. a member. I'm a member of the... Uh... You know the American Legion and stuff because my dad had the DD. I had to show my dad's DD two fourteen. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and my my father's father, he was in the navy. He served on the Arizona. Okay. Yeah. You know, nice. Before this is be well well before Pearl Harbor. Yeah. <laughs> so so that makes me the son of a son of a sailor. <laughs> the, the son of a gun of a sailor. Yeah. So so uh, yeah, that was my my. I put in you know five years in the uh, the California State Military Reserve. Well, let's talk about your life now, Rick. You're still a bass player. You're still a talented musician. You have connections all over the place. Do you have anything that you are doing right now in music? Are you in the studio, recording, talking to other bands? Do you have any? Do you have anything that's going on with you right now? Well, uh, for, first of all, I'm, what I'm doing right now is I'm sitting here talking to you, and, and <laughs> eventually, eventually, anybody who cares enough to listen in and, and hopefully be our being. Be entertained by my my stories. Uh, <laughs> I am. <laughs> I, I have I have a tendency to be long winded, so I, I apologize for that. No, no. Uh, you you have a story to tell, and uh, I'm a podcaster, so I I love to get your story out there. Thank you, thank you, and and and, uh, and, and God bless you for it. We we may have to do a part two on Rick Fox. That's I'm fine by me. <laughs> well, what Rick, Rick again? We didn't get enough the first time. We got you now. We got him again. Oh Rick again. God. That's a good name for a podcast. Rick again. <laughs> There's Rick Fox now, talking out you... his ass again. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have some editing to do on this podcast show. Now, yeah. are you still talking with Steel or anybody from the old days? Are you still in communication uh, with? Yeah, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay. Um, I I um, how does let's try and encapsulate this. Uh, last summer, uh, uh, after uh, after this, the Freak Show album was recorded and in the can and done, uh, uh, Chase on recommended me to the band, and so they contacted me, talked, and and I I, I joined for a little bit. Uh, they flew me to Reno where we shot the two videos for uh, You Shine and uh, It Hurts Me. I saw that great songs, and, and those are done, and great and. Songs. Uh, yeah, and and so uh, let's just say I, I uh, diplomatically uh, maybe let's just say I stepped in just to do the videos because uh, uh, things just didn't uh, didn't uh, you know wasn't meant to be maybe I don't know. I know it's a touchy uh, so, subject because it's all fresh right now, you know. Yeah, yeah, like I said, it's tender. So I uh, I, I just stepped out of uh, Freak Show, and they're going their way, and I'm going mine. And while that was happening. Uh, Ron, Con Ron Keel contacted me again. Okay, and he says, uh, um, "I got a new Steeler song. I want you to. I want you on this." And I went, "All right." Uh, Ron is putting out an album called Keel World. Keel World. All right. Keel World, and he's going to have stuff from all the you know, projects he's been on, Steeler being one of them. So he right. sent me the uh, he sent me the the, the basic uh, rough track mix, 
uh, I wrote my baseline and this, uh, this got this past the Saturday before I just, I went in, I forgot if there's a guy here in West Plains in, in Missouri, he's got his own recording studio. He's got a 32 track board set up. Nice. Uh, 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 Pronus or something, but he's got a nice oh, yeah. setup. I know Cronus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Pronus. And so uh, we went in there, Ron, Ron sends him the files. I sat down, I did a couple of passes. We recorded it. As, uh, 30 minutes later, Ron calls you up on the phone. He goes, goes, Rick Fox, you knocked it out of the park. <laughs> Sorry. And he goes, and you, and, and you played more than one string. That's, that's, <laughs> a, that's a running gag between Ron and I, because he says, bass players, he goes, like, you should only need one yeah. string. You know, and, and you're a pretty phenomenal bass player. Like, you're pretty humble when you say well, that. Well, nah, no. You, you know, I've heard you play. Dean, no. you know, there's guys out there that, that are so way more deserving of phenomenal. I'm, I'm nowhere near phenomenal. Well. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just a mean potatoes <laughs> in, the, in the pocket. You know, I'm a grooving bass player. Well, I, but how important know. is that? Being in the pocket, having some timing, having a look, having a stage presence, being able to lay down tracks and not have to repeat it over and over again. Anyway, but uh, when when you find a musician like Rick Fox and you put him in the studio and he knocks something out of the park, that's phenomenal. And you lay down well, the tracks and for Ron Keel to say that, you got you got to take a little bit of credit for that. Well, you know, I don't walk around with my thumbs and my suspenders going, hey, I'm Rick Fox, <laughs> dig me, you know. Uh, uh, people okay. people throw the word legend around and that makes me go. cringe. The I'm man, not, I, the man, the myth, the legend, Rick Fox. No, that, that makes me cringe. But, but, <laughs> see, there's there's so many more people that, that actually know. earned they've earned and deserve the title legend. I'm 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 more of an icon. I'm not, you know, I'm not a legend. And, and you're absolutely right. And I and I do celebrate you. You have you have a one, you're gonna leave behind a legacy that will never be forgotten in the music industry. Uh, you know, I, I, I just, I just wish my wife, my wife was still here to see this. You know, mm. uh, it's, it's like I, I lost a leg when she died. She passed away. So I understand. I understand. Uh, and, uh, she was, she was your, uh, she was your, your crutch, not your crutch, but your, uh, she was your wings. My wings. She was my protector. She was my defender. Uh, she was a witness to seeing the people uh, mistreating me and disrespecting me in the business. Right. She's like, fuck that. She goes, anytime somebody look at me wrong sideways, she was up there ass six ways on Sunday going, <laughs> you better straighten your shit out. That's my fucking <laughs> husband. You know, you thank know? you for so, thank you for saying that because Lois, my other half, the one that handed me the beer earlier, she will fight. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> she will fight to defend my honor. And and, and regardless, it's it's your your trusted, yeah. uh, your trusted partner, you know, in life. Tar, Tar, Tar was my my actual in the flesh living guardian angel, <laughs> protecting the wing knight of heavy metal. <laughs> That's right. You know, I I would not I would not have been able to put all of that together without her. Absolutely. Credit me too. Between her her and my father, they were the two that helped me get that off the ground. And and that is so important that you have a partner in life. Period. Don't forget about yeah. forget about and you have to, you have to have a vision, Dean, and you have to have passion. Absolutely. And 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 being a Capricorn with passion, sometimes that rubs people the wrong way. They see you as too pushy, too assertive, too aggressive, too bossy. I'm <laughs> like, you know what? There's my goal, and I'm I'm like a locomotive. I'm going for that goal. <laughs> and so am I, and Rick. I I'm an Aries. Be, I'm just as bad. Yeah, it's not intentional. Uh, it's just some people yeah. see that as an they perceive that falsely as as a territorial threat, and I've gone through that yeah. a lot and very yeah. recently. Well, and and so uh, you know it's it's I don't it's, it's not a fault. Rick, Rick, your energy is is um, overwhelming. And I'm sorry. Let me, let me dial it back a little. Your energy is overwhelming, and, and when I say that, I'm talking about myself. When I say your energy is overwhelming, when you walk in a room, like I told you earlier, when you walk in a yeah. room, you take – like David Lee Roth, he's, when he walks in a room, <laughs> you take over the room and you take over the band. And some people are intimidated by that. Yeah. And, and they feel like you're going to crush them. You're going to crush them. And, and I say that sincerely. 
Rick, you have that energy when you walk in a room. You're, and that's maybe the reason that you know maybe these guys are tossing you out because you're gonna you're gonna take over the room. You're gonna take over the project, and uh, you let have me, an let, energy. Let, let, let me give you a, a a a parallel analogy of that. When I would go to some of these these expos. And like the one, like I said, that, that gun show at Pomona, they had a military uh, a military costume contest for historical. So there was guys dressed from Rome, Civil War, World War II, right. uh, and so on, uh, Gulf War, things like that. Uh, and I would show up. I'd have my winged hussar, you know, my, my ancestry. <laughs> right, right, right. You, can't, you cannot beat that outfit. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I walked into one of these military uh, costume, historical costume uh, con uh, uh, competitions, and I, I physically, I, when I, I walked out from behind, and all these all these guys dressed in their uniforms, and they all look <laughs> great. They all look really authentic, like right out of history. Right, right. And I walked <laughs> up, and I, I, I seen, I looked at this guy, goes, "Oh no." <laughs> Like that. Yeah, it's just I heard him go, oh no. <laughs> and I, I I took I took every award at that contest. Oh my God. It, it, I got him sitting over here on the on the on, the, on my on why my, uh, why doesn't that surprise me at all? You know because the Wayne who saw us was the most spectacular uh, uh example of of European cavalry, hands down. <laughs> yeah, it's just nothing like a Polish winged who saw. You're in Missouri. And Other, otherwise known as misery misery and you mentioned there's some clubs and there's some things going on out that way but you also talked about some things going on which i won't mention yeah. and do you do you want to tell the audience anything you got coming up or anything that you're doing and how do they get a hold of you rick if can they communicate with you and yeah. anybody who wants to know who rick fox is can they still talk to you can they still see what you're doing no i don't want to talk to anyone <laughs> They want to uh, talk yeah. to you. Uh, like I said, oh. I just finished. I just finished the song with Ron. Okay. With that, uh, he's playing in. Uh, he's on tour right now. He's going to be playing at the West Coast. He's doing Vegas. He's doing Hollywood. Ron's doing uh, Vegas. When is I he doing think, Vegas? I I'm not sure. It might be vamped. Wait a minute. You mentioned that to me earlier. Are you going to come out to Vegas too? Okay. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> but if you do, will you let me know? Will you let me know? I, I, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. But, but, but I'm saying that I'm saying that because uh, on March fourth, uh, Mike Varney is going to be out there, uh, and, and Mitch Perry is laying down his leads for the song. Mike Varney, right, producer. Okay. Mitch, Mitch Perry is laying down his leads. Okay. For the, for the Steelers song. Gotcha. Gotcha. In Vegas. Gotcha. So Mitch Perry is going to be in Vegas. Okay. Dwayne Miller is already there playing with Ron. Nice. And then Ron will be there. So you have three fourths of Steeler. Ah. You, see where you see where I'm going with this? I see where you're going with this. A little teaser. So Ron, little teaser. Ron, says, Ron says no promises, uh, but if we if we can make it happen, maybe Steeler will play a little bit there in Vegas. Will you let me know so I can come down? Maybe I'll even take a few pictures and we'll line it up. Absolutely. For the next. Absolutely. And thank you for doing the Dean Vaughn Music Podcast show out of Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you, Rick. Thanks night. for having me. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. All right. You betcha, buddy.